Hey everyone, I just want to give a quick editorial note here. Um, about an hour and a half into this episode, my laptop's fans decided they were really excited about the conversations we were having and went into overdrive. So you may hear a slight ringing sound towards the end of the episode coming from my microphone specifically, um, but it's it's very slight and it kind of comes and goes. Uh, hopefully you won't even notice it. So uh, without further ado, here is the show. Excuse us. Pardon me, ma'am. Sorry, sorry. Move it, asshole. Oh, thank God. We got good seats. Damn right we did. What's up? We got the drinks. We got the popcorn. And the candy. I think we're ready, man. Hey, guys. Sorry I'm late. The bathroom here is nuts. Oh, my God. You made it. Yeah. It's about time, Nathan. Bam. Shh. The movie's starting. Hey there. I'm Nathan Simmons. And I am Dustin Goes to Hollywood, and this is the Silver Linings Playlist. And we are a podcast that tries to find the silver lining in some of cinema's bleakest endings. And uh, our regular listeners will realize they're not hearing a third voice yeah. on the show because uh, Mally does not like this movie and <laughs> decided he did not want to be a part of it. Yeah. So he, uh, I don't want to say gracefully bowed out, but he uh, just he basically sent us a text and said, I'm not fucking coming. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, the opposite of Leo in Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not fucking leaving. Instead, he's like, I'm not fucking coming. So, uh but that's okay, because we are joined by a very esteemed guest uh, on the show that I am so thrilled to have because I'm a huge fan of his work. Yeah. Um, but let me please introduce um, one of the, I don't even know what the proper terminology is, but this this dude is like a, a Resident Evil uh, god guru. in my eyes. Guru. <laughs> yeah. That's a good word. Guru. And I don't want to put too much pressure on him, but please let me introduce Nick better known as Neptune from the Resident Evil podcast. Welcome, Nick. Hi, hi. No, that was a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much. Um, pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was very thrilled to have you uh, accept uh, the invitation. So uh, for those who may not be familiar, you are the host of uh, the Resident Evil podcast, which I think goes without saying is probably the biggest fan-run Resident Evil podcast out there. Is that do you think that's accurate to say? It's certainly the longest running. It's, we're coming, <laughs> we're, we're coming up to ten years in January. Wow! Um, yeah, seniority. Yeah, you guys have been podcasting since 2012. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, January 2012. We Oof. started. Um, uh, we only started putting it on, uh, you know, Podbean and iTunes and things in 2016. So mm -hmm. we're, we're about four years behind in terms of downloads. But yeah, it's it, it's been we've been going a long, 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 long time and um yeah, we're really, really pleased with how it comes out and we've got obviously um love talking about Resident Evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. It's interesting because I found you guys um when Village was about to come out, mm -hmm. um, which came out earlier this year, and I was like, there's gotta be a Resident Evil podcast out there. Like it's just too big of a franchise to not have one. Right. <laughs> and of course you guys have the aptly named Resident Evil Podcast. So I'm like, all right, well that's the one I'm listening right. to. <laughs> it's slightly cynical of us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I like I, I think you guys have definitely earned the 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 at the beginning of the podcast because you guys are like well, I thought I was a fan of Resident Evil. And I I'm I've gone back and listened to every episode you guys have done since then. And I realize I know nothing about this franchise. <laughs> I mean, you guys are like encyclopedias. It's, it's 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 incredibly impressive what you guys have done over there. Yeah. And um, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys are are certified Resident Evil ambassadors now. Is that correct? Uh, to, to an extent, yeah. And then thank you again. Yeah, we've got our, our team on it. Uh, I'll, I'll shout out to the Batman in particular. Mm -hmm. He's he he is a walk, walking encyclopedia. He knows. <laughs> so much and he was featured on a Eurogamer article last year because oh, cool. um, he's done a 2,700 page yeah. um, t <laughs> timeline which is well wow. worth checking out. Oh, I, yeah I was I was telling the guys before um, before we had you book for the show that that uh specifically about the batman's work that yeah his his timeline is mm -hmm. so detailed that mm -hmm. <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> it's got to be embarrassing from capcom's side because they're like <laughs> i know there's no way they know all of this information <laughs> Did, didn't it come up because i was like i was trying to figure out ethan winter's like whole deal mm -hmm. like I, like i feel like we were talking about village and then you were like, well, actually, there's like a whole time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it goes back to like the ancient era of sure. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, it, you know, it's serious when the f opening pages, uh, the, the, the entry is 3.5 million years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 
but yeah, yeah we, we, I suppose we're, we we were fortunate enough to be um, given an advanced copy of of Village by Capcom. Right. So uh, that's that, so that, cool. That was, that was amazing. Um, yeah. That was really nice to experience and uh, be able to put out a review uh, of that when the embargo lifted earlier this year. That Absolutely. was that was a real special moment for us. But yeah, as I said, we've got lots of other people um, on, on our on our little team, and um, we. Uh, we we probably know too much, but it's interesting <laughs> your, 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 your your comment about how much Capcom doesn't know or does know or something like that. It, it's an ongoing discussion sure. uh, within the community about what's canon, what's not. And... Oh God, the canon arguments you guys get in is so. Well, I don't want to say arguments, but the discussions you guys get in, it's I'm like my head starts spinning because yeah. I'm like, there's who is keeping track of this stuff? Well, that's that's a really good question because no one really knows. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in, 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 in a roundabout way because you've got things like remake two and remake three exactly, which came out yeah. the last couple of years have really uh put the cat amongst the pigeons and there's no <laughs> definitive answer oh and i remember before remakes the two remakes got released that that stars tyrant one of the members over there was just like he was already mm -hmm. like putting his feet firmly at the ground was like this is not <laughs> canon or if it is we're gonna have to have a whole separate discussion about it <laughs> sure it's safer to say that it really is yeah. otherwise otherwise i mean you look at like the the wikia uh, the Resident Evil Wiki, which is great. Uh -huh. um, they've they've taken the approach um, that everything is kind of canon, which is the kind of like latest view from Capcom uh, sure. former producer Peter Fabiano was kind of like, oh, it's all in the same timeline, and you go, mm, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. it, it it doesn't quite work, oh, you know. No. Either Jill, for example, if a Jill Valentine was killed, but uh, was sorry, was infected uh, in you know in spencer memorial hospital or yeah. raccoon main hospital right. or she, she traveled under the tram or under underground right. you know, it, it can't be both right that kind of thing so that's that's the the stupidity of our discussions but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so the the, the wikia has kind of put uh, they've done their, their really good job they've kind of said that one account says this one account says that sure uh, i love that what, yeah yeah which is fine because then it presents all the potential options and that includes other spin-off games as well but oh sure yeah. A lot of the time, you just take a view and go, well, this is my opinion. That's what Batman does. For he sure. says in the timeline, this is my view. I'm not saying it's canon. This is just my interpretation. Right. For sure. Deal with it, you know. So yeah. no, there's, no, there's no real right or wrong answers. Um, For sure. With a lot of the main discussions. Some things can easily be ruled out as non-canon. Right. Like the movies for the, compared to the games, for example. I was yeah. just going to say, that's a perfect segue to this yeah. movie that we're talking about today. So You can see I've been doing this 10 years. Yeah. Just that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, you've got it nailed um so listener you can obviously tell by the title that we're talking about uh the first uh official live action resident evil movie from 2002 mm -hmm. um and you may be asking yourself why now why are we talking about resident evil now which is surprising because we've done you know over 100 episodes and resident evil hasn't come up once surprisingly but i mean there's this is kind of a banner year for for resident evil i mean we had the release of village earlier this year yeah um, we had Infinite Darkness, um, the uh, animated, basically, movie mm -hmm. um, that came out a few weeks ago. Um, we have the new Netflix series that's coming out, the new live action one. Mm -hmm. And um, when this episode drops, it's on the eve of, um, unless it gets, you know, pushed back a little bit, but it's on the eve of mm -hmm. the release of uh, Resident Evil, Welcome to Raccoon City, the the uh, live action reboot. Right. It's still by Sony. So, you know, <laughs> uh, my optimism is uh -huh. very thin. But oh, really? I'm, I'm really looking forward to I, it. I'm, I'm interested. Don't get me wrong. I am very curious. I think the cast looks interesting. Uh, it's different, definitely interesting choices. But yeah, I, I feel like I've just been, you know, with Sony handling other IPs, I always feel a little bit let down. You know, like I go in with a with a bit of a pessimism. So if if it is good, then uh, you know, then I can come back and be like, hey, I guess I was wrong. This is great. So yeah. Um, but speaking of this movie in particular, yeah. Um, where uh, uh, Nick, it's interesting because I whenever the the Paul W S Anderson movies come up, there's always um on on your podcast anyway, there's always kind of a bit tinge of an eye roll, um, <laughs> from the from the other members, but. I have to say, and maybe I'm speaking on a turn, but I kind of noticed that you have a little bit of an affinity for these these films. Is that is that fair to say? Some of them, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I do like the first film. I, I think do too. I, I've got a very soft spot for it. I um, because it, I think it's quite self contained compared yes. to the others. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think they eclipse, if you like, it by Extinction Number Three. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I, I like Three simply because it was 
on its own mm-hmm. it is very you know at that point it's very clear that they're not following the games and yeah. you know you just kind of take it after that you know afterlife and retribution you start going <laughs> mm, yeah you know where, where yeah. they didn't like it didn't explain like <laughs> right. how the virus was working that the t virus kind of oh, evolved sure. into the plaga for some reason uh and yeah. final chapter straight up has like for a movie that is written and directed by the same person who made the first film mm-hmm. it's wild how much the final chapter outright contradicts the entire plot of this movie oh yeah <laughs> i've not seen the final chapter yet oh, oh it's it's <laughs> a rough yourself. ride <laughs> we're planning on doing uh, because we do kind of like a few audio commentaries of the live mm-hmm. action movie yeah so i've said i've got it i've got it on uh 4k uhd uh-huh. oh. i treated myself <laughs> and uh, i said i won't watch it i'm gonna watch it fresh when we ever sure. do some audio commentary oh i can't <laughs> wait to hear that that's gonna be that's gonna be amazing no it's i i've we talked about this um i think on the last episode we did nathan but like when it comes to movies i very rarely turn them off yeah. like i am if I start a movie, unless it's just atrociously bad and unwatchable, I will finish the thing even if yeah, I hate it. I'm the same way. And it's same thing with franchises. Like, <laughs> I fell off the Saw franchise so quickly, but I've seen them all. I I saw Spiral in the theater. You watched all the Friday the 13th movies in quarantine. I did. I did. <laughs> yeah. And I've watched that final chapter even though I... I I wanted to visually vomit. Mm-hmm. It's just so bad. Yeah. But... That's that's neither here uh, neither here nor there. We're talking, of course, about two thousand two. <laughs> what I objectively think is a fun, decent movie. Yeah, no, it's it's fun. I remember uh, I remember watching this with my parents actually, and like when I was a kid, I was not allowed to like watch super violent movies. Mm-hmm. I think I would have been uh, I would have been thirteen. I think when this came out yeah. in theaters, and I didn't see it in the theater, but I when it came out on DVD, I remember. My dad like had talked to a friend of his who said, "Oh, it's more of an action movie than a horror movie." Yeah. And by that point, my first um my first R-rated movie in the theater was Blade 2, which oh, also came out this year. That's for a first R-rated movie experience. Right. <laughs> and so so like they, my parents were just kind of like, "Well, he saw Blade 2. He can probably rock with the <laughs> and he likes he likes Mila Jovovich more than any child has ever liked." You know? So <laughs> so uh yeah, so I I think I was like primed to love this movie and it was I felt like I was getting away with something watching yeah. it because there was like this big thing of horror but also action like the underworld was what a year after this and so like that was like a big watershed thing oh yeah the early 2000s was really b- big in the crossing over the horror action yeah genre uh, hellboy was a was two years away mm-hmm. um and you know mm-hmm. i i really loved this movie when it came out and it was one that we ended up buying on dvd and i watched a lot oh as yeah a, uh, as a teenager um on this rewatch <laughs> i see all of the problems oh, and still have oh, a yeah. really fun like this is a fun popcorn movie yes, and yes. i'm i'm also a much bigger resident evil fan now than i was when this movie came out mm-hmm. and i'm still just like okay this isn't this isn't that but also like i i i am i co-host a podcast about comic books and and like like you were talking about earlier like the the whole idea that you know we can accept different canons like with comic books i have to accept that there's you know a multiverse sure <laughs> i can i can watch this as the earth 2 version of resident evil and still mm-hmm. have a fun time sure uh nick what about you do you remember the first time you saw this movie and, and what you thought about it i i do i do i have i i can't express how excited i was oh. seeing this <laughs> yeah in the cinema and, and i i think I've, I've mentioned it before but i mean it's there's something about and and, and I, this is why I'm getting excited for Welcome to Raccoon City. Mm-hmm. There is something that inherently I like to see, and I, I say this as a fan, my franchise, if you like, sure. on the big screen. Yeah. Oh yeah, um, sure. You know, I was I was very invested in the games at that point, and but you know, it's still a relatively niche, mm-hmm. you know, computer game series, yeah. and then suddenly it's coming out on the big screen. Suddenly I'm in the cinema, and it says Resident Evil. And I'm like. Yes, yes, it's you know, and 
I you know I, I met the opening sh- just the opening shot which was ki- which kind of mimics uh, like an elevator scene from Code Veronica and things yes. like that. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. I was I was like, this is it, this is it, and you know, and then it's you know, then he said, oh, this is Spence. I was like, oh, is it? Could it be? You know, the, <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I, I was, the amount of connections I was making in my mind was ridiculous, but it was you know that there's enough in the first film. For it to you know to feel Resident Evil, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, it's you know and it, it it left an impact, it left a mark on the series uh, for sure. And whether, whether good or bad, it's up to you. But it, I don't know, it, there was something just wonderful seeing your franchise that I I've liked mm-hmm. for years up in lights, um, if you like. And so I was excited. I, I went with my friend Taz, and um, he is a big gun fan, if you like, and okay. uh, of, loved like the Matrix and things like that. And he and he still talks to me about it, how great the film is for the amount of guns that are in it. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, he loved all the shots of the zombies being taken down with like the uh, machine guns and things like that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he just think he, he thinks it's great. And um, so yeah, that there's it, it kind of appealed to quite a lot of different people. Um, I liked. I like the, the way the zombies were. Um, they were quite subtle yeah. compared to others. I yeah. mean, this is pre twenty eight days later, isn't it? Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. yeah like a, a few months, I believe. Yeah, so it's, it's more traditional in that sense. And um, I don't. Know, I I know as I know a lot. I've, I've like you said. I've watched the DVD so many times. I've watched behind the scenes. I know, mm-hmm. you know. So uh, yeah, it's got it's it's got a good watch out of me and, and I'm, I'm still quite happy to watch it I, th- I think it's great I think there's enough there the music's great the soundtrack by Marilyn Manson's awesome oh, I think the yeah. music is amazing yeah so there's there's all sorts and I get a, you know I get a little kick out of the fact that when uh, Alice is wandering through the, the mansion at the beginning you can just about hear the mansion theme music Absolutely. playing from the first game you're like mm-hmm. yes yes <laughs> uh, and the fact that it's the red, she's called the Red Queen which is an indirect reference to Code Veronica Mm-hmm. Uh, they say, you know, there's all there's all sorts of references that Anderson put in, some better than others. Um, <laughs> sure, uh, you know, uh, you know, like the train, for example. Oh, he's the called train, it, yeah. yeah. He's called it like the Alexi Five Thousand. Yeah. Well, if you'd looked a bit closer at the at the train from Resident Evil Two, he'd have seen it's the Galaxy yeah. Five Thousand. Oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, there's things like that, and he didn't help himself, bless it, Anderson. I think he he said in an interview. Oh, um, I remember that. He, yeah. Yeah, you will struggle to find a bigger Resident Evil fan Oof. than Paul W. S. Anderson. I was yeah. like, really, really. In the same breath as he's saying, like, but we didn't want to give people the game on the big yeah. screen. That would yeah. be stupid. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I've ranted on. But I, 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 oh, I, I still like it. I, I, I got very excited about it. Yeah, it's a fun time. So uh, no, I, you, we we talked about the DVD a little bit. I remember this. You know, like uh, back when DVDs were all the rage, and if you left a DVD on like the main menu how it would just <laughs> yes. loop and loop and loop yeah. this one distinctly is in my burned in my mind because i would fall asleep oh yeah watching it and then it would just keep going on the menu over and over <laughs> but this this was one of two movies uh, that are very distinct for me that i saw way too young of an age because this is 2002 when it comes out i'm 11 i'm not old enough to go see it right my older brother and his friends really liked the video games. So in fact, my first introduction to Resident Evil was Resident Evil 2. Mine too. Which is still my my favorite, the OG. Yeah. But this movie and another movie that we're actually going to talk about later this season is one of two movies that both just scarred me <laughs> for life, but simultaneously pushed me in the direction of loving horror movies. Nice. Um, the first one, um, which again, I'm not going to name the movie, but I saw when I was eight and it was a movie from the 70s mm. and there was a it also features zombies ah uh, okay one character that bites into it's the first time you see a zombie bite somebody and i, I just couldn't handle it i had to run out of the room i was terrified but then <laughs> this one comes out uh-huh. on dvd and my brother and his friends are watching it and like i said i'm 11 and i want to seem cool so i'm watching it with them <laughs> i learned the hard way that i was still way too young because when that first zombie bites Michelle Rodriguez, yeah. it scared the shit out of me, man. <laughs> yeah. And that's it takes like 30 minutes of the movie before you finally see a zombie. Uh, I wrote it down. It is 38 minutes and 53 yeah. seconds wow. <laughs> when Oof. you see the first zombie. 38.50. But, yeah. but now, I love both of these movies unironically. Yeah. Like, I genuinely think, for all its, its flaws and it's dated as hell with some of the CG and everything, mm-hmm. I still think this is a fun movie. Yeah. Uh, it's a comfort film for me. Like, it's one I can put on anytime and just have fun with it. And Right. 
I think it's pretty well known. It's a, that uh, James Cameron said, like, this is his guilty pleasure movie. Yes, he yeah. did. I feel no sort of guilt. I actually <laughs> genuinely like this movie. Yeah. It is, Nick, you briefly talked about this, but it is weird that this movie did leave an impact on the game franchise, too, because, you know, you get you get stuff like in Resident Evil 4 with the laser hallway. The lasers, yeah. Yeah, that's directly lifted from this, basically. But, like, love them or hate them, these, these movies do contribute i mean they were they were all pretty massive hits yeah um in their own right uh, at the box office so like love her to hate it this is still resident evil mm. um i mean i know you guys have talked about this before on on the resident evil podcast about like what makes a game resident evil like how can like you know a lot of people complain that seven doesn't feel resident evil and mm. in village two to that extent and i'm like well resident evil the game franchise kind of like is split into different eras right yeah. you've got like one through three, which is like the Raccoon City, the mansion, the gothic kind of bee schleck, you know, kind of stuff going on. Low, low uh, supplies, tank controls, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, heavy on atmosphere. Sur true survival horror. Yeah. yeah. And then you get four through six, which is way more action oriented. Especially six. Oh, God. I, I, I'll have to talk about six on another day. <laughs> um, <laughs> seven and eight. You know, you're going back to like the survival horror, but in a totally different direction. Mm -hmm. And and yeah, so it's it's interesting like that the films, uh, you know, they're not all directed by Paul W.S. Anderson, but like they have. They feel of a piece. Yeah, they do feel like a cohesive thing, like even if it's not to your liking. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's weird that these two entities, the movies and the games kind of run parallel to each other and yet never really cross really. I mean, they have like some you know a little bit of um like the laser hallway and stuff like that but really that's it yeah so there, there's quite a there's quite a few uh very i mean they're very minor um the, the, the laser hallway of course i think actually won an award that mm -hmm. for the, a gore award in germany oh <laughs> wow the best kill yeah i think like the like a chainsaw award type thing yeah. something like <laughs> that yeah. but that no you say it's i mean that Lasers weren't ever involved in Resident Evil until that. <laughs> sure. You say yeah. Resi Resident Evil Four did it, but if you if you play the spin-off game Resident Evil Umbrella Chronicles, yeah. um, the in the Umbrella's End chapter, the ex it, I mean Four's a bit of homage to the to the film. Mm -hmm. In Umbrella Chronicles, it's exactly the same. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've, ne I've never never actually played Umbrella Chronicles. Yeah, it's exactly the same with the kind of mirrored effect that they've got, and the you know, and the lasers coming along through a mirrored hallway, uh, okay. and it's and it's totally pointless because the Claire and like Claire, Chris and Jill go down the corridor, they come come across the right. they come across the laser, uh, and and then they and they get to the end, and then it's a dead end, so they have to go back. So it's totally pointless, oh. but <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's direct there, and and. And, and of course, in Umbrella Chronicles, it's the Red Queen as well, mm -hmm. um, and the White Queen, which is from Extinction. Mm. Um, oh right, yeah. So they, 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 there's there's a few. Th the Red Queen isn't it is artificial intelligence, but it isn't um, like a. It, it's not like it is in the movies, but yeah. it is an AI that backs up all of uh, Umbrella's data. For sure. Uh, well, so they've, they've used the font, the Anderson font, uh, oh, yeah. in the out in the out. Outbreak games. Oh, yeah. You can unlock Mila Jokovic's dress in Outbreak on one of the characters. Oh, we got to talk about that dress at some point. Oof. The red dress. <laughs> it's a great look. It's an unbelievable look. It's a great look, <laughs> but so impractical. Oh, sure. Oh, totally, totally. The, well, it's the Buffy of it all. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, he, the Helix viral. Sure. You know, the T-virus. That's That appears in Operation Raccoon City. Um, that's another thing. What else? You I'm see what about? I mean, Nathan, about like an encyclopedia? Yeah, I, love <laughs> I love it. I love it. Love it. Nick, live it up to to the the I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> this is this is giving me flashbacks of me on the casino royale episode <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> um well listen i don't want to i don't want to like uh to, to put a, a a slow roll on things but we are sure we still got to get into the actual movie so to, without further ado um let me tell you some details surrounding uh the creation of resident evil from 2002 so as we mentioned, uh, the director is Paul, w Paul W.S. Anderson, yeah. not to be confused with PTA. <laughs> um, wildly different movie, if that's the case. Uh, the movie stars Mila Jovovich, Michelle Rodriguez, Eric Mavius, James Purefoy, and Martin Cruz. Yeah. Uh, not mentioned in Roger Ebert's review, Colin Salmon, which, mm. how do you not include him? Because man. Love Colin Salmon. He rules uh, I mean, in this movie. Yeah. And this was right after he had done, you know, three Brosnan Bond movies. So mm -hmm. like. Yeah, he's big, big. Yeah, yeah. He's one of those guys that I always 
feel like is like one great perf- like one great movie away from being a headliner you know a huge star yeah, yeah he's yeah. so good don't forget jason isaacs he's in it yes. Well. yes yeah yes, that's yes, right jason isaacs, yeah very takes an uncredited uh cameo at the end there yeah it does yeah. And i recognized him from his eyes <laughs> that was like the <laughs> that is very thing. yeah it's very specific yeah yeah uh the movie had a budget of 33 million dollars and managed to gross 103 million dollars worldwide mm-hmm. um and currently sits at a 35 percent on rotten tomatoes oh, which i think is unfair yeah but simultaneously somehow i get it sure <laughs> so um well guys we we briefly talked about this before we started rolling but uh we're gonna watch the trailer here because i haven't seen this trailer in like 20 years so Same. yeah i think this will be the first time i've seen the trailer since the movie came yep. out for sure and this is um listener if you're not familiar with resident evil at all this trailer i'm again i haven't watched it in two decades but i'm gonna bet it gives you almost the entire story <laughs> so um here we go in a world it does start off with in, in a world kind of does it <laughs> in a top secret research lab security has been breached a deadly virus capable of contaminating the entire world original narration been... too mm-hmm. oh my god we have to get out of this building who's that it's the break! <laughs> Some special effects. I uh, know, this is very 2000s style editing. Yeah, we gotta show a ripple effect so that they know that there's a virus. <laughs> well, they do like the little inverted flashes too. Yeah. And cl- something that sounds like Clint Mansell's pie score. Yes. <laughs> but they have only three hours left before it begins infecting and mutating the whole human race. I wonder who's doing the video, if it's like somebody from the movie and they just altered it, or if it's mm-hmm. a third party. You have to get out. Don't listen to anything she says. She's a holographic representation <laughs> of the Red Yeah, this is like all action. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> Hell yes. <laughs> Who is that? Is that saliva? Uh, let me look at that. She isn't standing now. <laughs> Jesus. No one is immune. Oh, he has blue blood. Did you see that? Yeah. You're all going to die down here. A trailer. A trailer moment. Oof. There were two moments that were in every commercial for this movie, and they were, uh, they were, you're all going to die down here. Oh, yeah. And, and the jump off the wall, kick the, kick the dog kick the moment. Dog. Yeah. Uh, that song was by Bionic Jive. I've never even heard of them. <laughs> also, I'd like that the trailer ended with featuring new music from Slipknot. That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I forgot there was a Slipknot song over there. You know what? Uh, side note, I watched the, the Woodstock 99 doc last mm-hmm. night. It's great, but I, I felt like like I was suddenly, I had this weird moment where I was like, oh yeah, I fucking loved corn. <laughs> like I, I, forgot, I forgot that I was like fully, and we'll get into it in our, our next episode as well well but mm-hmm. or in a in a i guess at this point an earlier episode yeah, i don't the, even the know that's when we just did yeah freddie yeah. versus jason uh we we're recording these out of order but yeah mm-hmm. i was i was fully on board for new metal for a hot minute <laughs> for for me it was a very brief window it was like yeah. six months <laughs> that, that I well it, it was like it was like gateway so i could find other heavy bands real, that were good real music <laughs> yeah <laughs> i still like corn though <laughs> oh god <laughs> I'm sorry. I still love Slipknot. Hey, so, and actually, absolutely. Joey Jordison recently passing was a yeah. huge, huge uh, gut punch for me. So, for sure. Um, well, Nick, before we get into the movie, uh, we have a segment uh, <laughs> that I like to run here, where I like to come up with a drink mm. of the movie, like a like a cocktail or a specific beverage. Right. <laughs> and this this week, I actually found one that was already created. And I was like, that sounds it'd be interesting. So this is called the T-Virus Shot. Oh. And I'm going to credit the creator here. It's created by a guy named the Drunken Moogle, <laughs> uh, who likes to create themed cocktails based on popular franchises. Now, this this shot 
Nathan, listen to these ingredients. Oh, no. It's three-fourths of a shot of silver rum. Okay. One-fourth the shot of Everclear. What? And that's the liquid part of the drink. Okay. And then do you put a little umbrella in it? <laughs> so, actually, you put a blue Twizzler in there, and you um, la- wind it up inside the oh, glass so it looks nice. like the tea buyers vial. I love that. That's great. Very good. So... I, I don't I could not find blue Twizzlers anywhere. I went to like four different stores. Yeah. But I did find these things. They're like um warheads, but they're like ropes. So they they're blue and green and different stuff. So I have a blue and a green one here. I could do the virus and I could do the antivirus. Oh, perfect. <laughs> the antivirus that doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so here, I'm gonna go ahead and pour this. You guys uh c- continue talking while I while I make this drink. Um in anything you want to talk about <laughs> the wild thing about that trailer is it really does remind you where like movie it, it really screams at where movies were at the time I mean, oh, this yeah. is like this is like three years out from the matrix and the matrix is still all over the dna of every movie that's trying to follow it i mean yep. it, it changed action films <laughs> oh i mean you can you can tell just from the wall kick yes that's their trinity moment yes yeah, yeah, for yeah sure yeah. yeah it is a shame how much the matrix like influenced how we did action and stuff a shame but also great because oh, I, yes. the matrix is a perfect film absolutely <laughs> oh sorry nick go ahead oh no you know i was gonna yeah absolutely i mean it, it, you're right it shows quite a lot of what's going on and i think if if that was released today you could probably pinpoint what's going to happen oh in absolutely yeah every scene you could plot that whole movie out <laughs> yeah you see you can and you can see the zombified um uh, Kaplan, is it Kaplan? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, JD. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. You can see him, and you're like, okay, that ruins it. And you can see Kaplan at the end, mm-hmm. very, you know, on the train. You're like, okay, you know, it's all. Yeah. So it's a, it kind of ruins a bit of it. But I wonder. I wonder if they gave him blue blood as like a restriction for trailers, like you couldn't I think show. So yeah. that that makes sense to me. I mean, that you know, in the that was a thing that they would do in actual films too, like to avoid an X rating. Oh, they did that in a uh, Kill Bill. Kill Bill. That's why it goes black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? I, did, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they just that. said, you can't show that much blood on screen. So he was like, all right, I'll film it in black and white. You can't tell it's blood. He's <laughs> <laughs> right. away with it. <laughs> um, guys, I got to tell you, this shot yeah. smells like pure ethanol. <laughs> it's, that sounds terrible. It sounds awful. It feels like it's missing something. It needs something. In yeah. <laughs> but all right, here we go. I'm going to take a shot of the T-virus um, by the drunken Moogle. All right. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, not even the Nicolas Cage cocktail did that to you. Oof, oof. Um, all right, that's gonna be a shot that I sip and not take all. <laughs> yeah, at once. That sounds, yeah, that's bad. I'll, I'll, I'll keep you informed where I'm at, but yeah, I have a feeling there is an official drink though, isn't there? There's a, there's I think a, there is, um, yeah, yeah. You again uses the Anderson font uh, on it. Oh, the, nice. Yeah, it's a T virus, T antivirus. I probably should have went with that. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's like a monster or something, you know, a Red Bull or something like that. Oh, great. Oh, I'm I'm drinking a vodka Red Bull right now. Oh yeah, that sounds way better. <laughs> the uh, which seems much more manageable. That sounds way better than ever clear a silver rum together. <laughs> that's like that's like in the room when Tommy Wiseau mixes uh, mixes scotch and vodka. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Why would you do that? Oh. Oh. Um, <laughs> one thing I want to say before we get into the actual details of the movie. Um, yeah, this movie comes out um, right after. Uh, Paul W. S. Anderson's other movie uh, based on a video game, Mortal Kombat. What's a well? He's got he's got Event Horizon in the middle there, right? Yes, yes I'm sorry. I meant like I know he has done another video game franchise. Is what I mean, right? Um, which I actually do have a soft spot for that one too. I do too. Um, but this kicks off the video game movie frenzy yeah. of the early 2000s because right after this we get Doom, Ugh. we get Max Payne, Ugh. and we get Silent Hill all within five years of this movie being released. Am I crazy? I have a soft spot for for the Silent Hill movie. I think it's the best video game adaptation. Okay. I love the Silent Hill okay, movie. Cool. Uh, the first one. <laughs> the, the first one. The first yeah. one. That second one is dog shit. <laughs> I never saw the second one, but I, I keep finding that to be a, a, an unpopular opinion. But I'm just like, this is the one that actually has like the iconography, the vibe, like the, I don't know, there, there's something about it that I that really works for me. I think it's very well directed, yeah, that Silent Hill movie. Absolutely. Put, put it this way, after watching the Silent Hill movie, I then went out the next day and bought Silent Hill 2, 1, 2, 3, 4. Hell oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the highest compliment. It, it did its job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and, and we just have, I mean, there have been some real bad mo- video game movies. I mean, with Prince of Persia, I didn't even see Assassin's Creed. I just skipped right over that. It's, it's incomprehensible if, if even if you have wa- played the games. I think okay. the Assassin's Creed that's, movie that's is... That's about what I, what I feel like. Um, um, Sonic the Hedgehog, not that bad. Not bad. <laughs> not bad. I had fun with it. Um, Any, anything by U- Yui Bo is usually... Oh, sure. Oh, my God. Alone in the Dark. <laughs> Alone in the Dark. Uh, House of the House Dead. Of Dead. <laughs> yeah, House of Dead. I Blood mean, Rain. FX loved Yui Bo. Like the, they played uh, Alone in the Dark all the time on the FX network. All the time. Know? Yeah um all right well now that we're uh you know 30 minutes into the podcast let's talk about the movie <laughs> <laughs> um the first thing i want to say is screen gems yeah. the studio behind this is a real dicey studio i feel like yeah am i wrong in this like you either get really good movies or just absolute garbage yeah ones. but at the same time they put out so much so, so it was like one stuff. of those things where when that logo popped up at the beginning of the movie i like i still got a weird like excitement mm-hmm. and i was like this is either gonna rule or be terrible like, yeah well because i i get um we talked about this on another episode but like when you see a specific movie logo at the beginning like the movie you think of sure i think of the um the rob zombie halloweens when i see screen gems when you see screen gems uh yeah. I think, interesting i think of the, because they worked on a lot of Hanna barbera like they produced a lot of oh, Hanna Barbera sure. productions sure so i always get that and then also um oh shoot uh slackers mothman prophecies there's a couple that like pop into my mm-hmm. head snatch mm-hmm. is another big one for me oh sure yeah no they were running things in the early 2000s man yeah then they put up burlesque the uh <laughs> <laughs> the share yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> movie yeah speaking of icon uh, iconography like we talked about with silent hill i think the umbrella logo is one of the best logos ever yes like it's so simple and it's so visually interesting with the white and red. Which is why Ethan Winters is a moron when he <laughs> sees it in Village and is like, I I know this symbol. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially if you go based off like this movie is like Umbrella is basically the next Google or whatever. <laughs> like, sure. It's yeah. I mean, I want to nitpick this movie and say there's no way a company like um that is as big as Umbrella yeah would exist without being labeled a monopoly and broken up but jeff bezos just went to space bro like he, he's no, wesker and no jeff ceiling. bezos is the wesker of reality <laughs> <laughs> or maybe elon musk i don't know maybe the yeah. two are competing for it but uh no i i think the umbrella logo is is fantastic it's so simple and it's immediately you recognize it and yeah i just i'm glad they kept it i don't however like the secondary one that they use in this movie for like the ctv footage and stuff that's like the u with the umbrella in it oh yeah that that looks like a cw logo yes <laughs> it does yeah. look like a cw logo. <laughs> that's a good it does help it does help that it's everywhere i mean it's <laughs> an ongoing, right. ongoing joke every single almost every shot it's like um everyone's name tag every wall yeah. has it like yeah. <laughs> well i was gonna say like uh you know at fight club there's a starbucks cup in every frame sure. i feel like it's this movie has that with the umbrella logo. yeah <laughs> well like even even when kaplan pulls up the schematics there's like the twirling umbrella logo mm-hmm. and we're like yeah we know who we work for oh and they show it they show it on the bullet too that falls in slow mm-hmm. like i i get it <laughs> they put it in her wedding ring oh. <laughs> like, to, which would ruin her cover like within a second yeah yeah, yeah. well that's funny enough you mentioned that nick have you read the novelization of this movie <laughs> i have yeah genesis yeah okay i read it for this episode and wow <laughs> it's the most research i think i've ever done for an episode but i read that book on a plane and i was genuine i i read it on my phone on like the books app and i had to lower the brightness on it because i was hoping no one re- would realize what i was re- <laughs> <laughs> I was like getting secondhand embarrassment for the people looking over my shoulder or whatever reading it, but that book yeah. is insane because and you could you could vouch for me here. The first half of the book is just the first two minutes of this movie from different people's perspectives. That, yeah, it's, yeah. And then the second half of the book is just the movie. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've read it, but yeah, no, it, it takes it, it's a lot of build up. Uh, with isn't it with um, uh, Matt's sister? She mm-hmm. gets a lot more screen screen. Oh wow! Yeah, I was gonna ask about that, Lisa. Lisa. Yeah, her and Alice go to dinner. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> they go to dinner at an Italian restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> what do they order? <laughs> oh, it's, it's funny you say that. Le- um, Lisa, I think is this is this Matt's sister's name? Yeah. yeah. She orders like a very specific dish that like okay. I can't remember what it was called, but it was like no one would ever order that in an Italian restaurant. Oh, interesting! <laughs> it's a wild book. It's the only place you find out her second name, though, of Abbott. Yes, the, uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
I will say it does in those first like hundred pages or so, it does actually give you some good setup for things that aren't shown on screen. Like it makes things make a little more sense. But then after that first half, it's just the movie. Like, and it's on a fast forward button. Like they are racing to get to the end of it by that point. That was an interesting thing that I feel like we don't really pay attention to now. Like, like novelizations of movies were huge Mm -hmm. in, you know, the seventies, eighties, nineties, two thousands, because like, especially before the advent of home video. I mean, the 2000s, not so much, but like yeah. there were that was like the way to like get in on the ground floor of a new fandom. Like mm-hmm. I remember reading Peter David's novelization of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. Ooh. And there's like 80 pages about Mary Jane's like terrible family life and her like cussing out her stepdad and like all this stuff. That sounds <laughs> like, interesting, actually. It's really good. I remember it being really good, but also just like. I feel like I haven't read a novelization of a popular film in a long time. Oh, no, I think I think the only one I've ever really read besides this one was I read um, in the steep of my Lord of the Rings fandom. I read the Return of the King novelization. <laughs> What's the point of doing a novelization of that? <laughs> of a book, of a, bo- of a movie that's based on a book? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm a big Star Wars fan, so yes. I've, oh, yeah, of I've course, read yeah. all the... Um, I've got I've got all the novelizations of the f- new film fo- of since the Disney takeover. Nice. Mm-hmm. So um, they're really impo- they're really important to clear up the mess left by J. J. Oh, yeah. Try yeah. try trying to pick the fig there. You know, fix Nick, we, it. <laughs> we should have had you on uh, our Halloween six episode because we realized in that episode. <laughs> That somehow that movie is the Rosetta Stone for the rise of Skywalker. There's striking similarity. Like there's so many plot points that are the it same. Was fascinating. The, I've just looked up the writer of the Resident Evil novelization, Keith D. Candido. Yeah, yeah. He he wrote the novelization for uh, Serenity, the uh, the the Firefly mm. big screen movie, yeah, which yeah. I remember being a very good book. That like kept stuff from the screenplay that was uh, that was left out of the final film for sure if you want a if you want a good laugh pick up the um novelization for the final chapter i've oh not boy. read it i've not seen this book but um next time you next time you're in your bookshop pick it up flick right to the back and read the uh like the what the, the five paragraph um Ooh. Uh, oh and then, really and you'll just wet yourself with laughter oh now i'm um, curious i might have to go pick that up <laughs> it's just like unfortunately <laughs> the t-virus was already <laughs> airborne and so we're all doomed yeah. <laughs> that would be great i mean i know roughly what happens in final traps but um that would be great no this is uh, it, i mean i have to ruin it for you it basically says please do um something like deep in the bowels of the hive uh Wesker's blood sits oh, there, wait, yes, waiting patiently. What? <laughs> Wesker's waiting blood to is strike. sentient. <laughs> yeah, something utterly, utterly absurd. I mean, yeah. that's saying something. Yeah, oh it's my sentient god! Blood. Yeah, that sounds on par. <laughs> You, I can't wait for you to watch the movie because the way Wesker goes out like a chump in the final chapter, it's wild. I've seen it once and I was in a drunken stupor, but yeah, I do remember Wesker. (laughs) Yeah. Oof. Well, one day we'll have to do those movies. I have a feeling they'll qualify for the show. Absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about this opening scene because I think this opening scene is kind of great. Yes. Um, Especially to get you into what this movie is, especially if you're not a Resident Evil fan. I think we talked about the theme song, but I think the theme song by Marilyn Manson fucking rules. Yeah, the, it's Marilyn Manson and Marco Beltrami, right? Like mm-hmm. collaborated on it. I think yeah, so, yeah, it's a good score. Great there's score. some weird stuff like towards the towards the middle, like during all the flashback scenes. There's like this weird drum loop, but yeah, <laughs> I uh, I really like the the heavy guitar and mm. uh, and some of the techno stuff is great. Oh, the the creepy synth they use, the little piano keys, I think is yes, so on par with all of Resident Evil's like atmosphere and everything. Definitely. Like, it really screams Resident Evil to me. Um, but yeah, this opening scene is, is great. I, Nathan, this is going to have to be the season of, of the little, little scamps, scamps. <laughs> because Nick, you might, you're not privy to this, but uh, it seems like every episode we do this season, there's someone, a character or something that is like just the littlest devil and the red queen is that in this movie? Red Queen's a little scam. <laughs> she she play, that's what exactly what I wrote down because I, I in all caps the Red Queen's a scamp. <laughs> yes, uh, that's what I wrote down. <laughs> she stops the elevators, then drops them, then stops them, mm-hmm. and then holds them so someone can put their head through and chops them off. Yeah. Like it is it, it, there's no reason for her to she's have this much build up. It's so <laughs> she's such a troll. Yeah. My favorite line that she has though is 
because it's an AI and it's supposed to be, you know, have a personality. But mm-hmm. when she goes, I've been a bad, bad girl. I'm like, who Oh, yeah, when she quotes that? Fiona Apple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, she's such a little skate. Yeah, this opening scene's great. I think the elevator scene is is pretty iconic now in yes. horror movies. Yeah, the, the book just gives so much info on this guy with the coffee getting spilled on him. That's... Do they talk about whether or not he has a crush on the girl in the yes. elevator? Okay. Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> it's funny because, like, in the book... He's like apparently he has um he kind it's kind of like this show he does a bad movie night with his <laughs> friends all the time. Oh, I like him. I like him already. And he said it says in the book his last thought was I can't, I won't make it to the next bad movie. <laughs> That's <laughs> oh, what no. he's thinking about. But yeah, he also says like he thinks this woman's pretty, and if he ever decides if he if he lives through this, he'll ask her out. Yeah. Oh and then, man. And then her head gets cut off. So. <laughs> she she's an actress. Uh, she's sort of like the, the British version of ER. Oh really? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, she seems like she would be a big actress. Like that would be like a cameo. Oh, she's she's not. I mean, people. I mean, I, it's just something I remember. So in, in oh, okay. England, okay. in England, uh-huh. there's a program called ca- Casualty. <laughs> Great. That's name. a much better name than ER. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she, she was in that <laughs> roughly around the same sort of time. But oh, okay. God, it's, it's, so uh, she's somewhat known. So this this was hopefully a jumping off point for her. Is what she was probably hoping for. Yeah. It's funny though, because I, I one of my notes is everyone in this lab looks like they belong on Dawson's Creek. Like yeah. everyone here is gorgeous. <laughs> like like Umbrella does not hire Uggos. No. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> um no, I, I think this movie does have some great uh, imagery. I think all of the, the people leaned up against the glass yeah. is is fantastic as the as the as the gas is coming in. I do think again with the Red Queen being a little scam, a little counter of as it's dropping of like people being alive and it's like five percent four percent three percent it's it's kind of cheeky but um no i do think this is a great opening scene and then we jump to the mansion yes so the mansion's kind of interesting because you, you've i guess when you first see this movie if you're a fan of the games you're like oh they're doing it they're we're yes. in the mansion this is the first yeah game in the first movie you're waiting for the dog to jump through the window oh yeah yeah no i'm um, no, I, I have so many notes about this. I mean, this is what we're first introduced to Mila Jovovich. And just the way she's filmed, I already know the air chip. But I was like, guys, do you think Paul W.S. Anderson is attracted to Mila Jovovich? Yes. <laughs> Which, of course, you know, for those who don't know, they, they got married right after this movie. Um, I mean, I, I, not to make this into like a male gazy podcast. Mm-hmm. I'm just stating like empirical fact. She is gorgeous. Yes. And absolutely. she looks great in this movie. She's a star. She has a great on-screen presence. She is. I mean, like, I, you could tell that from the fifth element. Like, yeah. she's just, like, she has those eyes that, like, really draw you in, and there's a vulnerability there, but mm-hmm. she's also total badass. Like, I think mm-hmm. I think she's great. It's kind of a shame because, like, she's almost given nothing to do in this movie since she has... Agreed. But they try to justify that by saying, oh, she's got amnesia, right? But, right. Like, uh, which I've got, I've got notes about that as we go along as well. Oh, I'm sure you do. Uh, but no, it's just, it's kind of a shame because yeah, like I, I want to see her do stuff. And then by sure. the time we do, it's, it's the running on the wall and kicking a dog in the face. I'm like, ah, and we I have 15 minutes left of the movie. Right. Yeah. I'm like, and I don't know if that's kind of what I was looking for. But she, I, I would say the opening scenes of this movie with, with Alice, like looking at the note, looking outside and seeing the sunset, finding the locked gun case this is the most Resident Evil part of the film for me. Yeah. I mean, to the point where, like, like I love, I always love finding, you know, notes left behind in Resident Evil <laughs> games. Oh, yeah, to, like, to read, like, the, like, the files and stuff. And I, and I like that moment where she's, like, she doesn't know anything to the point where she's, like, maybe I write like that. So oh, she yeah, starts to write, like, a response. Yeah. Like, I, I think that's a really interesting bit of mm-hmm. visual storytelling in a movie that, like, likes to spell everything out for you, usually. Yeah, I agree. There's also a, bit of a major continuity error, though. If oh, you please. Look, oh, yeah. <laughs> if you look at the... Um, oh, please. Where it says, today all your dreams come true, because mm-hmm. it's supposed to have been written by Spence, isn't it? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, but if you look at it when she finds it, and then look at it in the flashback it's totally different it's a different hand right yeah oh, it's totally I noticed different. that too yeah. actually yeah, yeah. <laughs> no i noticed that and this is this is un- unapologetic for me and uh-huh. i don't know how i never put this together but spence it's clearly supposed to be a nod to spencer yeah right? yes like okay yeah, i, I can't believe be. i did not put it together until this rewatch <laughs> <laughs> no i mean the mansion does look great even though it it kind of looks more like a library than a mansion yeah um but 
I gotta ask you guys a question. Have you ever said, been outside and just said hello, and then four hundred birds fly away at once? Because <laughs> that that was a good little jump scare. And I was like, I don't understand what that's supposed to be yes. at all. Yeah. <laughs> no, it, Nathan, you had a good point um, about this movie not knowing subtlety. But like between that and then there is virtually no reason why one's team needs to fly Go in through, through the, the windows window. <laughs> when they don't expect anyone to be there anyway. And she's on the team. Yeah, the yeah. score. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is, why does the Red Queen's lockdown plan include giving the head of security amnesia? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, the Red Queen kind of does whatever it needs to do in this movie. Right. Um, I mean, it just makes if, if the T-Virus gets loosed. It gets loose. Why not have a way to like seal off the air vents? And right. you think they would have if they're developing something as deadly as that virus, they would have protocols in place, right? Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of questions here about who knows what and why certain characters aren't privy to certain yeah. information. Yeah. And it doesn't help that the score is sometimes louder than characters screaming information. Oh us. yeah. It's like <laughs> it's like interstellar. You have to put the subtitles on to understand what anyone's saying. Right. <laughs> I do have a question, though. It, does anyone else feel like that the room that the T-Virus is being made in mm. is ridiculously small? And, like, the team is its three people that are developing this this thing. It's, like, the size of my living room. Yeah. That that does link quite nicely, though, with the, like, especially the first game. Yes. Um, if, you, if you actually stop and look at this lab, you go, how is this a functioning laboratory? <laughs> <That's true. laughs> like, equally, equally Birkin's, Birkin's lab in Resident Evil 2, oh, the, yeah. the, the yeah. original. It's so small. and Where the tyrant is half the size of the lab. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. It's the only, only, like, the remake kind of made it actually far more plausible sure, as an sure. actual... Well, to an extent uh, you're not yeah. gonna kill me <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because you guys have talked about this on your podcast about like how every new resident evil game seems to end with a nest yeah like if they all end in a laboratory oh god yeah yeah <laughs> this movie is basically just that it's just the end of a resident evil game it's all in the lab <laughs> like mm -hmm. if you, the, the hive is one big nest but I, I liked it i liked it for yeah i liked yeah I, oh yeah that's another thing the heart the term the hive is used in resident evil outbreak as well yeah, oh sure yeah it's not quite the same but yeah i, I like that it's all very self-contained um within within that um i mean i i remember when yeah go back to what you said about the mansion i remember when they she <laughs> hits the lights mm -hmm. and then you see it and i i i think i audibly went oh because it, it wasn't <laughs> not that it's bad because it, it wasn't the the spencer mansion sure, it's obviously right. supposed to have been then it was like oh it doesn't look anything like it you know they haven't even I mean, tried it's like a museum yeah i think it's in it's all germany isn't it because mm -hmm. everything is um all that the station is all filmed in the under in the Reichstag. Yeah, yeah, and the, the German oh, wow. train station. Yeah, yeah. I love it. So. The, you having the audible groan is kind of like how I felt in Spectre when he says, I'm Ernst Blofeld. And I'm like the only one in the, in the audience that's like, ugh. Right. Well, that, yeah, there, there's been loads of discussions about things like that. It, it, it It's... It, it means nothing within the mm -hmm. within the film that it's in. You exactly. Know, it, it is literally speaking to the audience, yes. and that's not a good thing. It's direct fan service. Like, yes. directly. It is, it is, yeah. <laughs> And it's I I'm I'm Blofeld, okay? Yeah. <laughs> that 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 reveal, I remember going to see that movie with my girlfriend at the time and her response being who like like yeah. it doesn't matter in the yeah. world of this film mm -hmm. it, it's the con of it all it's mm -hmm. it's it's benedict cumberbatch saying my name is con yeah in the world of this film that means nothing to james kirk yeah exactly yeah. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. <laughs> I, you know what's unfortunate is this movie has no idea what to do with colin salmon like no to the character one and in fact we're going to get into this a little more later on in the movie but there's three big moments that i think are fatal flaws in this movie okay and the first one is has to do with colin salmon but we'll get there when we get there i i yeah i agree i think he's the best actor out of this entire cast uh -huh. like i genuinely think like we talked about earlier i think he's one great performance away from being like on everyone's radar but i think yeah for those that are into character actors, he's he crushes it, and he's been on our radars for a long time. He's great in stuff where you wouldn't expect anyone to be doing like their A game. Like he was mm -hmm. on a f like two seasons of Arrow, mm -hmm. bringing back the CW. He rules on Arrow. He's in two episodes of Doctor Who and yeah, leaves right. like an unbelievable impression. And he, I think, has one line in Die Another Day, and I'm like, yeah, give me more of that guy. He should have <laughs> been Bond. He would have been a great Bond. He would have been a good Bond. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he'd be a good Doctor Who, and I don't even watch doctor who so there you go <laughs> well i can tell you don't watch doctor who because you called him doctor who oh i'm sorry the doctor yes. is that, i don't know i have no clue i'm sorry nick i have no clue when it comes to doctor who. <laughs> um i never put this together either until this rewatch but is matt supposed to be a stand-in for leon 
because he's a cop. Mm. His his cover, I mean, like he's a cop that just got transferred in. Oh, I thought he said he was a reporter. He, no, his, his details aren't all on file yet. Are yeah, they? that's what he's yeah, Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. It could, yeah I, I, I did. I didn't think of that. Yeah, he shouts, "I'm a cop," and I forgive you for not knowing because, as you said, the music is cranking. Down yeah, I couldn't understand the lines there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. I think maybe that's supposed to be a nod to nod to Leon. So it could be. Yeah, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Um. So also speaking of uh, actors that are crushing in this movie, I think Michelle Rodriguez. She's always great. Like you said, I think she's given her a game. <laughs> she's. I. I love Michelle Rodriguez. Same. I mean, I'm. Look, I know you don't give a shit about the Fast and Furious movies. Well, but... It's funny you say that. I like the first one okay. a lot, and I think she's good in that one. Yeah. Um. And this was like right around that time, so like her career was starting to blow up. And she gets an Alice arc in a couple of the Fast and Furious movies because yeah. she has amnesia. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> All right, so let's jump to the Hive. I think this is kind of a cool setting. Like, like you said, Nick, it's very uh, self-contained, but like just the um the production design, I think, is really cool. I think it's yeah. interesting to like give them a fake sense of being above ground with the sounds and everything that's really cool fake city yeah i like that a lot yeah and i kind of like the name the hive no no it's no it, it works well it works better than nest uh, oh, for sure start, but um <laughs> the, my, my my colleague on a podcast romby who uh he runs mm -hmm. resident evil fan .com, oh, so, wow. and yeah. he, so that's one of the the oldest uh resident evil websites going he for was sure. he was quite in with sony back in the day with this and so was able to get quite a lot of information about this film before it came out um and he works in the movie industry himself so he, he's quite he's very he casts a very critical eye over these films but sure. he, he even he praises Anderson for his uh, the the direction he applies when using the kind of like CGI cutaways and the the map building scenes. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> he does it. He, yeah. He does it a lot in future films, which he doesn't necessarily need to. Yeah. But in this one, it, it works quite well. Hey, I was just going to say this begins Paul W S Anderson's immense fascination with three D cinematics. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. He's really into it. Yeah. But it does work well. It, it, it's a very clever use of as you say going back to what you just said about that sense of being underground uh, combine that with uh, with that direction of the of, of those maps and things like that you yeah. do get an idea it's a very clever very very clever way of just you know doing a instead of doing a direct cut from sure, place sure. to place like right. dining room hall b to that you know kind of thing well it's good for an exposition dump too it, it is is yeah yeah i mean our main character has amnesia so there is kind of a bit uh, I mean, it's a little bit of lazy screenwriting, but it's a good <laughs> yeah. way of being like, here's what's going on, audience, just so you know. Sure. Well, it's also fun because you get that feeling of playing a video game, like yeah. pulling up the HUD, like pulling up the map and seeing, you know, oh, have I searched this room yeah. yet? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, for sure. So this movie has one of my favorite things in a movie ever, and it's kind of, it's a goof, for sure, but... One thing I'm fascinated with is ADR in movies where it's clear that that person is not saying that not thing. speaking. Yeah, yeah. So they do a atrociously bad one with uh, Colin Salmon's character, <laughs> and it sticks out to me every single time. But when they first he gets a few of those, and and Kaplan gets a few yeah, of those yeah. too. When they first get down to the quote dining hall B, and it's you know the liquors and containers and everything. Yeah, <laughs> just this scene real quick. Okay, Kaplan. Dining Hall B. That's what it says on the map. Maybe you're reading it wrong. It's clear <laughs> his lips are not moving. <laughs> it's it's pretty great. Yeah, this brings me to my question. So Umbrella sent a spec ops team down here with incorrect schematics. Oh, I mean, why do they have to cut into the wall of the hive? Shouldn't they be granted clearance yeah. like to get in? Yeah, it, it makes it makes no logistical sense. Oh, and, and right before this, we get that great shot actually of the the zombified woman waking up in the water. Mm. Oh uh, yeah, which I think is a great a great little jump cut, and it's reused a lot in the series. Like every single one of Alice's like exposition dumps at the beginning of the movies, pretty much use that shot mm. or some variation of it. Yeah. Well, it also brought to mind this like. In this world, I guess zombies can survive drowning or sure. like being underwater for extended periods of time. Yeah. All those exposition dumps, they have to make up for the fact that in this film, you actually never find out Alice's name at all. That's yes. true. At no point is it mentioned. Yeah, she's not. Her, her name's not said. Right. I, I actually, I had that moment in the last scene where I was like, oh, do they not say her name in this movie? Nope. 
it's kind of it's kind of brilliant that they get away with that and you you never really notice until the end like nobody says her name or anything and right they make up for it in those sequels because every one of them starts with my, my name, name is, is alice. alice this is my story <laughs> yeah every single one of them um there's also i think it's rain in here that's a, that they're trying to get into the door and she screams what's taking so long and oh, i'm like yeah. hey lady that's never helped at any point in history <laughs> <laughs> right i just thought that was funny um let's jump to the laser hallway yes like i said this movie has three fatal flaws i think this is the first one oh where they kill half the cast with a fucking laser yes well no i think this i think this sequence is good yes i just think it's a bummer that it's that we don't get more people fighting zombies in this movie. Sure. No, that's a fair point, yeah. No, my my flaw is that you kill off four people, I think, in this scene, in the hallway. Uh-huh. And I'm like, I get it. It's a movie. It's a horror movie. You gotta have a body count. But, like, Colin Salmon is, especially in the book, portrayed to be, like, the smartest, badass motherfucker ever. Yeah. And he, and he falls for this stuff. And it's like, I don't know. I just wish they wouldn't have killed him off so quickly. I, sure. I get at the end of the movie, you need to kill off people. But... Think about who's left after this. We got Alice, Spence, Rain, JD, Matt, and Kaplan. I'm like, you could have probably spared JD at, at least that a couple point of them. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know. I just wish Colin Simon was in this movie a little bit more. I do love that his final word is shit, though. That's pretty <laughs> right. great. Which uh we also get a moment with uh that's very similar to an injury in our last movie where a guy's fingers get lasered off. And yeah. that scene that shot really upsets me. <laughs> I think it's. I think it, this scene is very well directed yeah. and shot. Like, I and again, we're talking about the little scamps. I think this laser is a little scamp because when that guy tries to jump over when it, it ju- I have laser jumps when he jumps. Scamp. It's, <laughs> it's so not meant to be, but it's so funny. It is really it's funny. So there funny. might as well be like a woo 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 sound effect. <laughs> like, <laughs> and then just the biggest troll of all time is when it turns into the full grid. Like, right. Colin Salmon, he almost gives, and maybe this is giving him too much credit, I mean, he almost gives like that Jeff Daniels and Speed moment where he knows he's about to die. Oh, sure. He has a very similar look of like, oh shit, <laughs> they got me. I think it's I think it's fantastic. No, the laser hallway scene's great. I have seen people complain about that and ask, like, why not do the grid pattern from the beginning? But yeah. I think it does come back to that thing of like the Red Queen is enjoying this in a some way. Like yeah. the heightening is kind of fun and it's fun for the audience too. It's very sadistic. I like the fact that when they come back to it, the bodies have gone. Yes. And, and they make the point, where have the bodies gone? Which oh, is that's, yeah, that's great. great. Which is a funny point because it, it, again, it's a bit of a nod to the games or something yeah. because obviously <laughs> sure. once you kill a zombie or one, the body just disappears. Yeah. So it's like, where have the bodies gone? And instead of just like ignoring it and everyone pointing out, oh, there's a continuity error. They, yeah. They're just going, yeah, they've gone, whatever, deal with it. <laughs> You know? Right. Well, it's funny because they point it out and then they do nothing with it. Like they ne- they never come back to that. Right. right. Yeah. And then they kind of contradict it with JD coming back later on. But that's okay. I I, I forgive him for that. But I do think it's a nice little nod to the video games because the yes. people in the crowd are probably getting a good knee slap out of that. You know. Yeah. I do think this movie has a lot of lines that are just quotable but have no meaning in the real world like <sighs> i love the guy at the beginning when he tries to get the axe he goes oh fuck the doors oh and yeah. he tries to chop the, the glass i think that's great <laughs> uh we already talked about the you're all gonna die down here is a great line great line that that comes back a lot in the sequels mm-hmm. the need to feed is pretty funny because i keep thinking need to feed the need <laughs> to <laughs> feed what is the code what is the what is four six five yeah <laughs> i also like i like um no fire in here no fire <laughs> like at the beginning of yeah. the movie oh, yeah the- <laughs> yeah that's there's no fire yeah that's pretty great um, that's jeremy boltz's sister oh really yeah as oh. anna boltz mm-hmm. that character oh, i missed that yeah the producers i think sister and then of course the you're gonna have to work for your meal is I a like pretty great too. line <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i i really enjoyed i okay so i like james purefoy a lot sure sure he's great in um that show with kevin bacon um the following is that what it's called oh sure he's he's also great in altered carbon mm-hmm. um he did this little uh e robert howard a robert e howard adaptation called solomon kane that i thought was really fun despite a very low budget but he's he oh and he's great in uh he's great in john carter also i've never saw john carter and i hear it's good but i will go to bat for john carter as like a really fun underrated popcorn movie okay um but 
his attempt at an English at an American accent. Yeah, <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it falls apart like at some points. Like there's one bit where he's just like, uh, uh, you know, you you don't know anything or something like that. Like he kind of he sounds a little bit like uh, almost like Liam Neeson, like doing yeah, an American bit, accent at bit. some points. Um, but he's he's really good in this. And but there's there's just a couple of moments where I'm just it's almost like the movie forgets he's a character. Oh, when he realizes he's the bad guy at the end, <laughs> yes. and he immediately falls into the bad guy tropes. Yeah. It's kind of hilarious <laughs> when he does the. Oh, I'm yeah. like, oh, come on, man. <laughs> yeah, he becomes mustache twirly like immediately. Yeah, yeah. I would have I would have put this question out there to both of you. If you're one in this situation and you see the grid coming, what's your final words going to be? Yeah. Is it going to be something as impactful as just him going shit under his breath? Oh, no. Mine would be something like, uh, like <laughs> it was just like, eh, no thanks. Oh, that's, I don't know what mine would be. I would I would have tried to move back because he wasn't quite against, that's the, true. against yeah. the door. That's true. Yeah, He had a couple of foot. He could have moved back just to, for sure. Know. I do think the effect, though, of him like oozing into cubes is kind of great. Yeah. Like it, it still kind of holds up. Oh, the reflection in the door is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's like you can see it kind of like this little mound yeah. kind of separating in the door uh, reflection. Oh, they they rack focus real quick so you don't keep an eye on it too long. <laughs> and I think uh, I think uh, Mia Jovovich's uh, reaction to it is really good too. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of which, do you think uh, Mia likes being called Jovo? No, because Mila Jovo. I, okay. Would anybody? <laughs> I don't know. I just wrote that down. I was like, that'd be a cool nickname for her, Jovo. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> but like shortly after this, I mean, we get we they put together their. Oh, this is another this is another thing that feels very Resident Evil. The uh, the EMP machine is a puzzle that they have to put together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which I love. I love that they have to assemble this little uh, monolith in order to shut down the Red Queen. Mm -hmm. Oh, speak. Let's talk about the Red Queen. So I, I mean, it's obviously early two thousands graphics and doesn't really hold up but i do think there's almost it almost kind of plays into this movie's favor of it being really creepy and off-putting and not, very uncanny valley yeah just not quite there it really you know sells me on like how creepy this character and i do genuinely think the you're all gonna die down here line is very effective at being creepy as hell well especially because of the the quick turn like oh, that the, little yeah. that little like side eye she does is very yes. good yeah and then we get some of the great imagery of this movie like th that i genuinely think is great like when all the doors open and everything and you see the shadows of the zombies on the wall uh -huh. i think that's very true to resident evil style horror definitely and i think this movie needed more of that i i do i agree and i think the first the first appearance of all the zombies i mean you get uh rain gets bitten immediately you've got the one guy pulling the axe behind him wh while he's you oh, know that dragging guy, his that's one a leg great extra yeah, walking on his broken ankle. Yeah. I wish some of the faces, like the half faces, had been makeup and not CGI, because I think some of that hasn't aged super well. Yeah, the guy that turns to the camera with the half face doesn't hold up that right. well. Right. Yeah. But there's some really good designs here, and I think the ones that are like pure makeup designs are very good. Yeah, I agree. I know. I, I, I gave it a bit of a pass, because you think they haven't actually been infected for long. Right. That's true. Um, That's true. And there wouldn't have actually been any minimal cannibalism i would have thought that's from true. Him. Yeah. so i i gave it a bit of a pass but i absolutely to see what you're saying um yeah that that chap who, who walks that day he's a, i think in the backstage he, in the behind the scenes he's a, he's a dancer yes yeah, a yeah that's dancer, right yeah. And he could he could he could do that or something like that which was um which was quite cool yeah no, yeah I, I really like i really like that because it's quite hard actually to you can uh, when, when, when you see those doors open you can just about see the shadow mm -hmm. can't you in, in, in the, there, there it is there it is that kind of thing yeah yeah you can hear the the moans very subtly it's really good oh yeah the sound design in the sequence is great mm -hmm. i mean the like again the sound of the axe scraping across the floor is excellent it's good. yeah i that that actually it was so funny like i there's some movies that i watched a lot when i was younger that i have like these sense memory moments mm -hmm. and this is one of them like i the second I heard that axe scraping across the ground, I was like, oh, shit, this yeah. is that scene. Like, I got really excited. Yeah. I think that's the mark of a fun movie. Yeah, yeah. It's a shame he didn't use it. Yeah. yeah. It's a shame he didn't use the said axe. Because... I know, right? They, I, I want to see them using tools like Day of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, I'm actually very glad we have you on this episode because I have a question for you that your expertise might actually come in handy here. Cool. Is Rain... The character that gets bit the most throughout <laughs> this franchise before finally turning. 
because holy crap, she gets bitten a lot. Are you counting her clones? In the <laughs> oh sequels? my god, we're not gonna even get. No, no, just this movie. But she gets bit like six times, I think, before finally turning. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, I guess so. Um, ooh, blimey! In yeah, I think usually it's just one bite. It depends on. I mean, I'm getting really technical. It depends on what strain of the T virus. Sure, sure, uh, sure. The, oh, the, please the... get technical. I love this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. In in Resident Evil Degeneration, for example, <sighs> yes. uh, which is the first CGI, uh, the security <laughs> guard in that is bitten, and then he transforms into a zombie within pff, ten seconds. seconds. Yeah, <laughs> right. seconds. I remember so that. Quick. Yeah. Compare it to the Epsilon strain of the T virus from the first mansion yeah. with the famous itchy itchy tasty um oh right. that's true yeah uh, file that he, he writes yeah and that takes a number of days because it's all the potency and then um compare that which which does raise debates um in resident evil zero oh yeah rebecca chambers is in fact the only time a main character is canonically bitten oh, by yeah. a uh by a bow yeah, one of the monkey yeah. eliminators it takes a proper chunk out of her in, on her shoulder oh yeah, that's right about that. she never she, she never turns it's the only time you ever see it because people go oh like are the green and red herbs canon and they go yes they're canon but <laughs> you 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 aren't as a character, you're supposed to make it through these experiences sure, without sure. ever getting bitten. Exactly. Uh, but yeah. Rebecca's the only time where someone is actually bitten on screen, and yet she doesn't she doesn't turn into uh, a zombie. But then that's because it's the the monkeys, which are really really old BOWs. Uh, yeah. right. So there's all sorts. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I've been wanting to revisit Zero because oh, I, it's my my been. buddy Joey's like one of his favorite games of all time. And I I remember playing it back in the day, but it's one that I it's one of the only ones I have never revisited. I've actually been replaying it in the past six months, like yeah. playing it over and over again. It's it's underrated for sure. OK, cool. Yeah, I'll check it out. I mean, it's it's got its flaws, sure. but all those tank control Resident Evil games for the most part have some aspect that doesn't really hold up that well. But it's fun. It's a fun game. It's one of the best looking on the uh, PS4 oh, yeah. Yeah. Xbox. It looks absolutely yeah. stunning. Cool. Um, yeah. yeah. But, well, well, yeah, it's, it's all right. If you like your item management, my God. Yeah, they don't give you nearly enough inventory space. That's what I remember being the most frustrating part of it was the, was the oh. inventory. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah, it's bad. Um, was this like um, the first movie to really give you that moder modernization of how zombies look and sound? Because this is, as we mentioned, this is right before 28 Days Later, but... You know, zombies before were these lumbering, you know, arms extended out. Um, sure. And this is like a very animalistic kind of feeling. They growl and they scratch and everything. Like, was this the first movie to kind of do that? This was kind of like, to me, like the stepping stone between Romero's Dawn of the Dead and yeah. and, and Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead. Like, sure, there's, sure. There's like an animal. Yeah, like you said, there's an animalistic quality to them. They're they're a little they're a little more keen, a little more clever than which is funny because the Red Queen says like they have almost no intelligence. And I was like, well, they're at least using blunt objects. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, this ever clear is kicking my ass, by the way, Nathan. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. Interesting. Yeah. No, no zombie at the series at that point had ever used a weapon. Well, did they actually use it or is he just kind of dragging the axe along? He's just dragging it. Yeah. 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 Outside of outside of Resident Evil Gaiden. It was until like four before we saw them kind of using weapons, right? And then you get into the whole debate of the T-Virus versus the Plagas anyway. Right, that's true. Um, this is where we first get introduced to the liquor. And I got to say, I almost like... Every time I watch this movie, I kind of forget the liquor is a character because the movie kind of forgets about them. Right. <laughs> For long stretches of time, you don't see them. There's some great shots of the liquor like running through the facility that reminds me of that that great moment in two with him like going over the window. Oh, it's a great moment. Yeah. There, but the yeah, the liquor, the CG liquor looks bad, has not aged well. Not but at all. You can tell they did build a practical liquor. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. Yeah. It would have been yeah, it would have been cool for like a Jurassic Park kind of practicality to it. Would have been great. Those close ups are really good, especially the the sequence where it starts to mutate and it's it's like that like sinews are like pulling apart mm -hmm. and its muscles are growing. Like I don't know. It, it, it that is actually the reason why I think maybe you, you've heard the rumors that. Doesn't Paul W.S. Anderson say that there was an NC-17 cut of this movie? I believe that. Like, he had to edit it down so he could get an R rating. I would love to see if there's more practical effects and if it was just, like, the gooier stuff that, like, had the MPAA up in arms. Maybe. Well, let's get to... This is a big problem I have with this movie is that 
after that first zombie attack, I feel like there should be no splitting up in this group. <laughs> right. And yeah, Alice just kind of wanders off. To have a to have a, a nice little intimate scene with Eric Mabius. Yeah, well, I was going to say, we're going to get to the, the part with the dogs. Oh, yeah. Um, she kind of just wanders off by herself. That's true. I, I noticed it this time because I was trying to be a stickler for it. But when she gets the gun from um, Calvin, I think is his name, the guy that watches the dogs. Oh. Which is funny because she just kind of kicks him to death. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I stopped counting after eight because there's eight dogs, I think, and she fires like 20 bullets. <laughs> this is a very large clip on this gun. <laughs> this is another case that I think the dog close ups are very good. Like mm -hmm. the, the, the gooier practical effects are very good. And some of the CGI is really dodgy. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they mostly like these to me are like the most accurate to the games in terms of like the design. I, I, I love how they look. Oh, the, the dogs look good. Yeah, I'll, I'll say the dogs look pretty good. I, I agree. Um, they look best, I think, in Extinction. They got it right. Yes. right. Yeah, yeah. 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 In that kind of cage uh, moment right at the beginning um that kind of pit i think there's something to be said for extinction being maybe the best of the series because mm. it, it has that fun it has that fun mad max vibe which i love you get like the fight like you said the fight with the hillbillies at the beginning is really fun like the the scavengers but you also get yeah you get the dogs looking more accurate you get crows like there's there's some stuff that they do in that movie that you wish was kind of spread out a little more liberally through the series well Here's my problem with the franchise going forward from this movie. Yeah. It's a huge glaring error in its Mike Epps' character. Oh, uh, Kmart? No, no not he's, Kmart. Um, Kmart's the girl. Uh, what's his name? I can't remember. I can't remember either. I, I watched Apocalypse recently, and that movie holds up until the introduction of his character. Oh, I mean, Jill Valentine is the most accurate any character has yeah. looked in those movies. Yeah. And I think, I don't know who that actress is, but I think she does a fantastic job as yeah. Jill. Sienna, Sienna Gilroy. Yes, yes, she's fantastic. So in a movie, great. But then they give Alice everything to do that Jill should be doing. Yes. Yeah. To the point where like Jill like starts to fight somebody and then Alice has to like set a fire that actually yeah. takes care of things. LJ was the name of my yeah, character. I... <laughs> yeah. why, why haven't we taken off yet? Because they usually drive a Cadillac. That's right. <laughs> oh my God. Him and his gold desert eagles. And when he stops to pick up the prostitutes and realizes they're zombies, I'm like, this is just a walking caricature and the worst I do I do like the gag where Nemesis like lights up that building, takes out all the stars members, oh, and God. LJ is just you still do? standing there. I think it's really funny. But, it's funny, I mean, sure. for the wrong yeah, reasons. It's, it's not a good movie. No, it's not. <laughs> we'll have to eventually do that movie. And then Nick, if you're if you're interested, you're more than welcome to come back. <laughs> we one. can finish out this franchise. Yeah. Seven years from now, we'll do one from for every season. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> When we're drawing on employment, uh, social security will be right. covered final chapter. <laughs> That's right. Um, I kind of ask, there's got to be a scene missing here because when I think it's Matt and when he finally gets up to meet his sister. Yes. And uh, he has a conversation with Alice. They just cut and they're sprinting away from zombies. Yes, I have the same note. I, I think that scene, I think Eric Mabius monologue, the dialogue's bad, but I think his acting is really good in the sequence where he's trying to figure out yeah, sure. why someone. And I, I like Eric Mabius a lot. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I and I also think that the the idea that alice doesn't know if she's the villain if she's like this opportunistic killer i think that's a really really cool concept it's that's not cool. explored quite enough yeah. but yeah i wrote i thought i missed something because they have this quiet conversation then it cuts to the schematic showing them being chased by zombies <laughs> which also down this by hole. the way zombies have heat signatures in this movie <laughs> oh that's true um, yeah, that's true but yeah it's uh yeah it does feel like we missed something this is also where we get the red queen explaining kind of the science behind the t-virus sure and it's actually kind of believable up until she's like oh the need to feed they have to keep eating i'm like right when they're like oh you know fingernails and hair continue to grow after you're dead and we just zap those cells to like bring them back online i'm like that i if for a movie that's trying to explain zombies, it kind of makes sense. Again, this is a $30 million B movie. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's kind of like the charm of it is that they really did embrace the, we don't really have to explain the science, but we're going to give you just enough that it's like almost plausible. Yeah. Um, that's one of the, that's what I really like about this movie is that it's, it's not really not super concerned with the how and why, but it gives you just enough to like kickstart the action. Yeah. It's probably for the best because <laughs> sure. if, they, if, they actually, if they had stuck to the actual law, that would have opened up more 
can of worms. They they couldn't have said, oh, oh we combined the DNA of the leech yeah. with, with with the virus from an ancient right. flower we discovered in right. in Africa. You're like, okay, yeah. fine, whatever. Oh, if they would have had a scene where someone sit like one comes back he reforms out of those cubes and he sits her down and he's like hey, listen let me tell you about the tea virus <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> and that's the, that's the, that's kind of the charm of the series as a whole i remember like when i played village recently and the you know ethan gets his hand cut off mm -hmm. and he just kind of pours some first aid on there and reattaches his hand yep and it reforms his jacket as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I, I laughed so hard, and I actually had the had the twist spoiled for me. I won't spoil it on the show, but like, but it is. It is at the same time, it's like if you're Ian, you're like, well, obviously this is how first aid works. You yeah. know? <laughs> no, it's it's funny because that twist in Village, it's like, well, duh, like it kind of makes sense from the player's perspective. Oh, I love it. I genuinely, I'm. A big fan of the twist in Village. Oh, it, it really, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Oh, we, I could spend hours speaking about. Oh, the sure. Twist. Well, I've just been like, it, for in Seven, you get your hand cut off with a chainsaw, and then you reattach it with staples and a and a liquid. Yeah. And you're like, no, oh, well, I guess that works, and you keep and this going. This is functional. <laughs> yeah. It's, and, uh, but yeah, but it's you're in in Seven. It, it it's implied that as soon as you enter the right uh, the manch well, the, the Baker plantation, mm -hmm. you are infected because you start. Um, you're infected with the mold yeah. quite early on, which yeah. is why you're able to, as you said, you know, reattach your hand or something like that. Right, exactly. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's that's they kind of play that as a twist in Village a little bit. That's what I'm saying. Like, oh, that's how you're able. <laughs> but it wasn't it wasn't needed. It was, no. it, 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 it's explained in seven. That's what right. I'm saying. By like, the end of the uh, at the end of the end of the game, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's kind of like a no duh. It's a it's a viral <laughs> hat on a hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. It's it's like getting bitten in the same exact spot. You were already bitten by a zombie. <laughs> or struck by lightning <laughs> twice. <laughs> um, I didn't notice this before, but when they're in the sewer, Matt drops a get over here. Yes. Which I thought was a kind of little funny nod to Mortal Kombat. Oh, I laughed at that too. Yeah. I never noticed that before. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I just wrote down, I was like, dude, you, you guys got to stop letting Rain get bitten because you get bitten <laughs> by JD again, right? Here. Right. <laughs> so many times. <laughs> Speak, we haven't really talked about him that much, but Kaplan. Yes. Um, the character of Kaplan. I think the actor is really going for it. Like I think so too. Yeah. He does give a very good, like, I'm not cut out for this, I'm just the tech guy kind of performance. Mm -hmm. Like, especially when he watch he is the reason they all get killed by the laser hallway. Yeah. It's expounded on a little bit more in the book of like he missed a line of code and that's why he didn't and he didn't see it and that's why all of them get killed because he right. he shuts it down right as it's too late. He is <laughs> in uh another <laughs> exceptional uh slash terrible video game adaptation. He's in the DOA movie. Uh, oh I never saw which that. is terrible but hilarious. Mm, uh, I believe if it. you want to see a movie where <laughs> Eric Roberts puts on high-tech sunglasses that let him do kung fu uh, <laughs> then you're in luck oh, i mean that sounds that sounds like uh heavy rain with the high-tech sunglasses yes right <laughs> right right <laughs> and then we get to alice remembering everything mm -hmm. um i do like this little effect they do of her kind of like in the halls of the hive and it gets slowly put back together yeah. like yes. her remembering things i think that's a genuinely good effect very good yeah, yeah. and then we see the the rabbit being injected with a virus right and she figures out that there's a cure and everything. Did you want to see killer rabbits later in this movie? Like, did you want that to pay <laughs> oh, off? <laughs> like, like one rabbit infected with the virus? I mean, I wouldn't have been opposed to it. Right. I'm just going to say that. Like, sure. if it was on the train or something with them when they got there, that would have been fine. <laughs> That's the final boss. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I do think this is when I, I know and I was like, dude, I think Michelle Rodriguez might be too good for this movie because her slowly becoming a zombie, yes. she plays it fantastically. There's so many sequences in this movie where she has her head down and she's kind of just like mm -hmm. twitching or like wigging out a little bit like her physiology. You can you can chart her physiology changing. It's yes. a very good performance yes. that's in the background of this movie. And I am. Um, I was actually watching the BTS materials of this movie uh, last night, and she was having so much fun on set. Oh, sure. Like, she was really into this movie. And like I said, I think she has a great performance. I think when she finally does become the zombie, it's... Yeah, she rules. It's yeah. terrifying. It's really fucking good. I also think for a high-tech, and this is, might be a continuity error too, for as high-tech in like a state-of-the-line facility that the Hive is, you would think that 
the Red Queen would have some kind of protocol in effect that when the T virus is removed from the storage case, uh-huh. that there's some kind of like alarm that sounds. Right. Like, you know, or when it breaks, you know, like it takes a few seconds and then she finally releases the gas that kills everybody. Right. Like, it's kind of weird. Or that at no point did she say, actually, turn around. It's on the train. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's a, a good a point, too. Like, I I don't know. I, Spence is walking around with his face exposed this entire time right. and she never logs. Hey, he's not one of the three scientists working on this he's virus. the guy that i filmed on the cameras stealing yeah. the t-virus yeah, it's, yeah. it's a little bizarre hmm. but it is one of those things that you just have to you just have to sweep under the rug in yeah. order to get into yeah, the I plot guess. yeah by the way i gotta ask when you guys first saw this movie did any of you put together that spence was the one that um stole the virus initially and split the coffee on the guy and everything i i didn't but it's it's so funny because when you're watching for it now you see him in the opening scene like yeah. you see him shut the door yeah <laughs> no, no, no i was I saying i didn't I, I didn't really well i feel like the movie tries to purposely put him in the background yes. and like not do much with his character so you forget about him yeah for the most part but i mean when in hindsight when they find him on the train i'm like oh well that's clearly <laughs> why, why else would he be in that storage closet <laughs> but like yeah even in the sequences where like we're like where they're trying to rescue kaplan mm-hmm. you don't see him like there's yeah there's that there's that scene where that i wrote down this is like a microcosm of the movies is there's four people struggling to hold back the zombies in the background while alice is like kicking ass like she's fist fighting and twisting necks <laughs> she throws a zombie down and it looks like she just kind of dislocates his shoulder and yeah. it kills him like <laughs> that's very, a true. very odd shot it says in the book too i can't remember i think it's rain from her perspective she's like oh alice kicked a zombie to death she has to do that 500 more times now or something <laughs> oh, like that, that. Like that's ju- great she jumps up on the pipe yeah and like grabs the zombie with her with her legs which puts her in perfect position for the zombie to bite her thigh right but you know it is what it is <laughs> but then we we get all that shit with cat including a suicide fake out yeah. and then he just looks over and spots the hallway he can use to leave yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very like if he did notice that it would have been very similar to the ending of the mist where like man you could you just waited just a few seconds long <laughs> yes yeah absolutely yeah. and also i mean again you kind of have to buy into it but you would think that if they're working on a virus as deadly as a t-virus and they have an antivirus that they would just administer that antivirus to all of the umbrella employees right. so this type of thing doesn't happen happen but i guess that's umbrella cutting corners or whatever. It is t- 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 totally umbrella that's exactly what yeah. they would do yeah. that's exactly right yeah um and then this of course is where spence realizes that he's the bad guy which right it's kind of funny explain to me his plan so because so is the idea that he misinterprets what alice wants to do or does he have his own ideas of selling the virus it's in the book a little bit better explained okay um where he and alice are umbrella employees uh-huh. and their whole point is they're in charge of the mansion and because the mansion is an entrance to the hive they're trying to ward off tourists or potential potential like you know stragglers or something that come in there but they pose as a husband and wife uh-huh. to keep the press off of them right basically to like oh they just happen to live in this mansion or whatever yeah that makes sense and then spence notices alice um you see it in the movie him having the conversation with lisa outside and he has that microphone right that he's hearing everything and he realizes oh alice is kind of betraying the company and his idea was like well if they're going to try and bring down umbrella i'm going to steal the t-virus and it's it's the same as every villain of resident evil they're like i'm going to steal the t-virus and sell it on the black market right but it's (laughs) his it the implication is that their cover chain like they fell fell for each other because you do see them like sleeping together as well which i think is a thread of a cool idea in in the book it's a little i don't want to say better explained but it is expounded a little bit better it's like Alice was not really taken by his personality, but she thought he was hot and that he would he would at least be good in bed. She's correct. <laughs> I mean, and he's then, he is very attractive. Yeah, and then if attractive. you watch Altered Carbon, the dude has a huge dick. <laughs> oh, well, cool. I guess I'll be put Altered Carbon on my watch list. <laughs> but no, I think it's I think it's just he's the stand in for like a Wesker type or something like that. He's just going to take the virus and sell it to the highest bidder. He, he is the closest thing we have to Wesker in this in movie. This movie I, yeah. I, I do agree with that. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Like it's, it's, it starts and stop like that. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. 
oh this is around when we get my favorite rain line in the movie where she says uh, oh can i can i guess yeah go for it <laughs> when we get out of here i think i'm gonna get laid it's a great line i don't <laughs> <It's a great laughs> she line. delivers it so perfectly <laughs> no i agree i also again i think her performance is great when she goes for the axe and she's gonna break the window but yeah. she sees all the holes of someone trying before and she just goes oh fuck <laughs> which is a great which is a great callback to that opening sequence mm-hmm. where like the axe only takes out one piece of the the window oh god and then the book the glass has a specific name really because it's it's an umbrella creation. You, this sounds like like a Tolkien novel. It's like we so have to bad. like we have to hear about like the history of the mines of Moria we, before we, we can even meet do. the Balrog. We kind of do. It's called like oh fuck, what's it called? It's like plastic glass, like plastic and glass. Come on, yeah, I know, I know. That's great, <laughs> but it's <laughs> anyway. Uh, this is where we get introduced to a stealth zombie that rises up out of the water and bites Spence. <laughs> and yeah. I'm like, man, you gotta watch out for those stealth zombies. <laughs> I do love that the implication that everyone else in the room has seen the zombie and they're yeah. just playing the quiet game. That's a really, <laughs> I like that. It's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, we get one of the most confusing parts of the movie to me, and it it always confuses me. And then it's just a Deus Ex Machina. It's, you know, the queen, the red queen saying, look, I'll give you the antivirus or whatever, but you got to. But you have to kill Rain. Yes. Um, And then she smashes the computer monitor or the TV monitor. And that's immediately when everything gets shut down or rebooted. Right. And I'm like, wait, did her smashing a monitor kill the red queen? <laughs> yeah. I think I, I fall for it every fucking time. And I'm like, oh, no, it's just. No, it's just weird timing from Captain. Yeah. 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 <laughs> incredible dramatic timing it doesn't he say i fried the bitch or something like that yeah 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 to fry her ass yeah. it's pretty fun it's a great line yeah. um and then of course we also see spence get <laughs> fucking ragdolled by this computer animated animal which gets a laugh out of me every time oh the liquor it's, yeah 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 well that's straight out of that's straight out of two that yes yeah. yeah yeah 100 yeah. percent with the on, on the ceiling yeah he, he gives the, the liquor gives a, a fourth wall breaking like wink at the camera which i think <laughs> yeah. is so great Great. Yeah, but that's a nod. That's a nod to Mr. X in Resident Evil yes. Two as well. Yes. Yes. He, he, walk, he, he, he walks up and smashes the camera. Mm-hmm. You know, ah. and it's in remake too. So, yeah, I just wish it didn't mutate. Yeah, I, I, I think it has a liquor. It looked it looked pretty on point, right. and then it mutated into ironically what the liquor beta would go on to look yeah. like in Resident Evil Five. Right, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So I, I I would have preferred if it stayed what it was, but then I, I can understand why they did it because people would be expecting a proper big big bad like a tyrant yeah, or right. something like that and they thought oh, we've only got the budget for a nemesis uh, for, for the liquor so they yeah. thought well, well just make it a bigger one there you go. right <laughs> yeah well it's also able to get somehow for the t-virus room to the train in no time yeah yeah <laughs> right right it's like sprinting there <laughs> but then we get um you know alice kills spencer with the axe which is i think is good we, we do get an axe kill finally yeah. right and then we get on the train i'm missing you already yeah it's a pretty good line yeah and then we get um the train scene everybody going back uh matt who basically doesn't really get much to do in the movie right gets scratched by the liquor which that'll come into play and we'll talk about i'm sure well i love the i love the liquor scratching through the sides of the train i it's think good. that's a really that's a really good sequence yeah it's good i do say kaplan's death though is a little odd to me oh getting pulled out of the uh driver's seat yeah he gets bitten earlier in the movie and then they give him the antivirus and then they just rip him out of the side of the train. And I'm like, I get it. <laughs> right. You gotta you gotta get the body count up as much and get these people down to just the two. It's but a I'm good like, fake out though. You you think Ka- at this point Kaplan's gotten through so much that of course he's gonna be standing with Alice sure. at the end of the movie. I guess my my whole thing is like it would have been cooler if he would have somehow survived. I don't know, maybe the train wrecks or something and you think he's dead. And then you bring him back in a later installment. Oh, sure. And like his character arc, he would have grown. Well, I mean, if you're into characters inexplicably surviving oh, I previous know. installments, then I know. just watch the sequels. There's, pl- <laughs> there's plenty of those. I know. <laughs> but yeah, we get the cool liquor fight, which... And then, uh, of course, uh, Rain turning into a zombie, which I genuinely, again, I think it's a great performance. The little necks, the net little neck pop and then yeah. the opening <laughs> the eyes like you. You think for a second, like, oh, Rain's on board. She's ready to throw down <laughs> like she's going to help out. Well, even yeah, even in zombification, she still has the patented Michelle Rodriguez neck crack. Yes, <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. But also like the fake out of like you think she's dead and then. 
Alice is going to shoot her and she takes the gun back. That's a good moment. Right. Where she's like, oh, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> yes. But yeah, when we have the fight, the liquor gets the the inexplicably explained rods that are just on this train. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Like in case they have to build something, there's plenty <laughs> yeah. of uh, yeah. Which is insane because also there was like weird uh, construction stuff in the last movie we covered. Yeah, and Freddy versus Jason, just weird <laughs> construction stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, but also I get a kick out of the slow-mo bullet that Alice shoots liquor with that basically does nothing. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a weird choice to have slow, because this movie doesn't really do slow-mo, and then it comes to nothing. So. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I do think the shot of, the way they the way they dispatch of the liquor is really fun. Yeah. You know, they, they shoot Rain, and she falls back into the door controls, and that opens the hatch. But it's pretty cool. The shot of the liquor on fire hanging by its tongue <laughs> is both <laughs> hilarious good. and, like, just badass. I it's think that's good. a really fun moment. Yeah, I agree. And you got the f impression that it was smelling really oh, bad. Yeah. She's like, oh, ah! yes. You yeah, know, the way Mia sure. was acting there. I couldn't imagine what a barbecued liquor smells like. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right all right well let me recap the ending here because sure. this is my third and final fatal flaw of this movie which i'm sure you guys can guess what it is but they get back to the mansion just in time and uh, nick you might know this but correct me if i'm wrong i think one of the the the, the shadow of the blast doors closing is cg correct and they spent a shit ton of money on it yeah really <laughs> it's just a shadow <laughs> yeah that's correct shit. yeah yeah anyway um they get back into the mansion um with the antivirus Matt starts mutating, like yeah. having a tentacles popping out of his his liquor wound. Oh, I think that shot is wild. Yeah, I, I actually that stuck with me too since like since my very first viewing. Yeah, yeah. Well, then th th a pair of doors open up, and then a bunch of hazmat suit dudes uh, pour out, grab Matt, throw him on a stretcher. And all the while, Alice is trying to fight them to get back to him. Yeah, she can't beat up a bunch of fucking nerds. Yeah, <laughs> I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing. But then, yeah, you get Jason Isaacs as an uncredited William Birkin. Yeah. He uh, mentions he wants to put Matt in the Nemesis program. And Lovely. As I got to say, this is the third and final fatal flaw of this movie because obviously you're trying to set up the sequel, um, which the ending does too, the actual ending. Um, but we all... I think can agree that the one of the reasons the nemesis doesn't really work in apocalypse is because we know it's a who the character is beneath the mutation right and yeah nemesis you don't want to be an empathetic character he's supposed to be this unstoppable brutal killing machine right and matt is just, just, just such a nothing character to then become the nemesis like it's it just doesn't work see for me the problem is when when Isaac says, which I think, by the way, wasn't Dr. Isaacs in the sequels named after Jason Isaacs? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, yeah. So he says, we're reopening the hive. I want to know what went on down there. And yeah. in my head, I'm like, maybe equip your first spec ops yeah. team to do their job properly. Yeah. <laughs> like, either, either give them correct schematics or give them a fucking camera <laughs> so they can show you yeah. what they've found. Yeah. Uh, it does work. I mean, this is the thing with them. Um, brother and what sure. goes on there's all, sure. all, all sorts of r rival factions that's true you, you know the assass assassination of birkin for example yeah. in resident evil 2 is because he was thinking about defecting to the u.s government so yeah. right the, the u.s you know you know uh, so umbrella send in the uss and hunk to kill him oh yeah um, uh -huh. Nemesis is made by the European branch who have a, comp a healthy competition mm -hmm. with USA, right. uh, Umbrella US, so they make rival uh, Umbrella uh, uh, hunters and things like that. So there's all sorts of um, internal wranglings. Um, Birkin is uh, an enemy of Alexia Ashford right. in the games yeah. um, because of her age and their genius. So there's lots of competition. <laughs> That's so true. It, it's not out of the realms of possibility that you know they, they would give... Give them like this could be a, another team that comes in and like find oh, yeah, out yeah, what yeah. the other group knows. Easy, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's true. That's true. I guess it's on brand for Umbrella. Yeah. I guess from a movie like a screenwriting uh, aspect, I'm just like, eh, I don't know. And plus, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. It's also kind of a hat on a hat because this ending, the actual ending, is top tier for me. Like this ending rules. Yes, Mally has a uh, coined a term on this on this podcast, Nick, where he's like, this is a rock and roll ending. Yes, <laughs> like it's just badass as shit like um she wakes up full of needles and wires yeah. and she screams as Very she like Matrix pulls them out of her mm. yeah yeah but like yeah i mean her putting on the lab coat it's a great look of her yes. 
essentially naked with a lab coat over it, holding a shotgun in the middle of this wreckage of the city is, yeah. I think even by 2002 standards and maybe even 2021 standards, this final shot holds up. Yes, I agree. Like, I think the effect work is great. I remember waiting for the, the wait for the sequel being excruciating. It felt like forever. Yes. It felt like forever. And it was only a couple of years. It was two years, but yeah. I remember it feeling so much longer because I thought this I mean, ending was so good. For me, I wasn't alive at the time, but this is like waiting between Empire and Return of the Jedi. <laughs> like, it just felt like forever. Sure. sure. <laughs> but no, I, I think it's it's badass um and but that being said it also if you go right into apocalypse right after this it doesn't really work nope as an ending of the movie because you don't see anyone else in this final shot right. like it's just her amongst the wreckage and then there's we've... blood splattered across like skyscrapers yeah. like it is so far reaching in this final shot and, and then in apocalypse there's the whole city is still there the city's <laughs> still kind of going yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah so and then, of course, we cut to the credits where Slipknot kicks off and it's, <laughs> sure. it fucking rules. <laughs> um, but that's the movie. Um, is there any other final points we want to to cover before we get into like our, our wrap up stuff? Um, I, I mean, personally, I, I, I would agree with what you've kind of said at the beginning. It, it's, it's just for fun popcorn fodder yeah. yeah you know you don't take don't take it too seriously sure. um certainly don't, don't compare it to the games right appreciate the appreciate the nods um and yeah you can eat if you're a big fa- fan of the games you can easily get offended by these f- <laughs> by these sure. films oh yeah and um, people did <laughs> and people do, and they, yeah they do and then, again while the, while the reboot people are a bit more excited because right. they seem to be doing a bit being a bit more faithful for some of the uh the accidentally not, not on purposely leaked screenshot uh, uh-huh. uh, set, set photos, yeah, you know, yeah. just to get everyone into that kind of thing. So I hope so. Yeah, it, I, I, you know, I, I like it. I've, 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 I, at the time, I bought, you know, bought it on DVD, got the soundtrack, yeah. bought my play single, um, yeah. got posters, got everything. I was, I was very in fact, in fact, in fact, the DVD I've got is is relatively rare of it oh um we had an ex- we had an exclusive paperback slipcase version over Ooh. in england that only came out at a particular um shop that nice. is now defunct oh, okay so that that's quite that's quite a cool little um quite my, my as I said, part of my collection <laughs> but it's it, it's relatively nice. rare it's cool yeah it's quite it look it's it's quite good actually yeah um, right. but yeah I, I i like it i like it i, I so i picked some a lot of them all up again because we were starting to do audio commentaries for them uh-huh. and uh, i still I, I still think the first one's solid i agree, I agree. if it's just the first, if, if they just stopped at the maybe like the third one <laughs> right I, you know i think it would have sure. been like a, a, a solid sequel but yeah but then even like the fourth one i'm i'm looking forward to watching again simply because it's because it was filmed with the James Cameron's 3D fusion camera. Oh, yeah, right. that's right. Yeah, yeah. And things like that. And and even Final Chapter, um, by all accounts, uh, from what I've read, is a demo worthy for Dolby Atmos. So I'm mm. quite keen to hear how that works. This, the, yeah. <laughs> The the sound mix in that in that movie is really good. So yeah, there's always. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of the action is a little hard to follow, but <laughs> you know it's it's a bit it's a billion dollar franchise. Yeah, the, right. the movies they've done really well considering, and um, you know this one you know this this one obviously did really well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'll always maintain that the first one is is a solid. You know, six and a half, seven out of ten. Yeah. Um, from my point of view, I I am right in the same in the same wheelhouse there. Yeah. I I think this is a perfectly adequate adaptation. Yeah. It's not too close to the games where, you know, if you're, you're you'll be lost. I think a general audience appreciates it. Um, but man, I'm I'm very excited to hear your commentary on final chapter. That's yeah. that's going to be a day one download for me. <laughs> <laughs> that won't be yeah. Uh, we're, we're only up we're only up to afterlife. Okay. Yeah. So we got a while to, while to go. Yeah, I mean, like I read I read the Romero script. I was for this. just going to say you read the script, Nathan. And I, you know, you're talking about sometimes you can be slavishly devoted to something and it doesn't work. <laughs> and yeah. this one almost, I think would have made people even more frustrated Probably. than the movie we got Probably. because like, you know, Romero did that great live action resident evil two commercial, which mm-hmm. got him the gig to do to, to pitch this movie. Mm-hmm. And like, it, it, it's weird because it, it includes characters and situations from the game in ways that we don't quite recognize. So I almost feel like it's even more of a tease mm-hmm. than not having the characters at all. Like we have, you know, the, George Romero's script in, includes 
like the main characters are Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine, who yeah. are a couple in this version. Ugh, I don't like that. And Chris uh Chris owns a ranch uh <laughs> and he like makes a lot of jokes about just being like a regular farm boy. <laughs> That's a Star Wars nod, right? Yeah. It's got to be right. And then, like Jill Valentine is a is a member of Stars, but she's like under in deep cover in a relationship with Chris, and like most of the movie is her trying to choose between her loyalty to uh, Chris or to Wesker. Oh God! Like it's a it's a weird movie. Like Wesker and Barry are childhood friends who also like served in the wars together and like they there's all these jokes about their camaraderie and uh wesker here's the thing that like kills me is that the dialogue throughout is pretty terrible like wesker at one point describes what the virus does and one of the members of stars says christ this is like night of the living dead you know (laughs) in a george romero but the parts where it works is like it does embrace the absurdity of the games like there's Mm. we get we get zombified animals which i think we've missed out on in in some of the movies and in the more recent games like they fight a zombie shark they fight yawn the giant snake you know like there's some some fun stuff they have live action yawn i'd I'd be interested in seeing they actually have to find and use different colored keys throughout the movie (laughs) okay there is a laser net but it's actually just a trip alarm that then shoots acid at people well but uh all right yeah it culminates in a fight with the tyrant which uh for some reason the script goes out of its way to specify has the heart of a rhinoceros (laughs) (laughs) wow (laughs) all right the the only knock that I like really have against this script is that it ends like crazy abruptly because Wesker has like wired bombs underneath the city to his heartbeat. And what? when he's <laughs> killed by the tyrant, the city explodes. Oh, and so God. The, the, it like slams to credits like as soon as the city explodes. Oh, but God. I right. think we did get like as much as I love George Romero. I think we got the better movie even yeah. though it's not like a strict adaptation it's still a really fun popcorn film i think i agree based on what you're telling me <laughs> yeah there's there's more to learn from the romero movie i'm i'm interested in reading it oh for sure like i think it's still worth a read yeah. i think you should read it it's really fun okay. i'm just doing like cliff notes basically sure sure i have a little bit of trivia that i want to throw out to you guys um and to the listener before we get to the wrap-up stuff but uh did you guys know that this film originally had a different title ground zero right yeah i was <laughs> I was going to build up to that. But oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. It, it was originally called Resident Evil Ground Zero. And of course, this was like right at the time of September 11th. So they dropped that that title. Right. Smart choice. Yeah. Um, this movie also, according to, uh, to Mila Jovovich, she had to ADR the entire movie. Oh, wow. So uh, this, she apparently wasn't happy with the performance and had her very thick Swedish accent. And so they, they looped back and she gave a much uh, lower register um speaking voice interesting okay i think it works well i agree i mean it's hard to notice Mm -hmm. yeah do you know who was originally set to star as alice there was one person who was going to do it and another person who was offered to do it and they're two very famous actresses oh i I don't think i know this well uh, you mentioned one of them earlier oh really was it carrie ann moss no i was gonna probably get was it maybe the from underworld oh kate beckinsale no oh oh Sarah Michelle Gellar. Oh. Was originally set to star as Alice. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Oh, I didn't know that. And then actually, Gwyneth Paltrow was offered the role. Oh, no thanks. That's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm confident saying that I, yeah, no thank you. Um, I do think uh, Roger Ebert's review, if you haven't read it, is quite entertaining for this movie because oh, yeah? both this movie and Apocalypse are two of Roger Ebert's 50 most hated movies of all time. Whoa. <laughs> and his his review is scathing. We have we've talked about we've talked about Roger Ebert before though where I think like it, Yeah, he does not like horror. He's not a big yeah, he's not a big fan of genre film. Yeah. Like it's it's very it's very yeah, kind of a sticking point with me when it comes to Roger Ebert reviews. <laughs> can, can I can I read my favorite line though from his review cuz it's it's fantastic. Absolutely. He says the characters have no small talk. Their dialogue consists of commands, explanations, exclamations, and ejaculations. <laughs> yes, an ejaculation can be dialogue. If you live long enough, you may find that happening frequently. <laughs> <Huh>. <laughs> That's insane to put it in your movie review. <laughs> what a baffling sentence. Also, uh, 
the word zombie is never properly spoken throughout the movie, which I think is kind of impressive. Right. And my last little bit of trivia here, and we've talked about this before on the show, but sometimes, Nick, I don't know if you've ever frequented IMDb, but sometimes the trivia sections can be kind of wild for movies. Yeah, sometimes it's bullshit. Sometimes yeah. it's like full on like someone being like oh i found a connection and that it's just something hilarious that they thought of this is the third one and it's also a bit of insanity okay um this is my favorite bit of imdb trivia for this movie it says the final fate of the matt character is known to fans of the games dot 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 and to those who watch the sequel oh my god <laughs> i'm like well no shit (laughs) you know what one of my favorite bits of imdb trivia like of all time is Hmm. uh on the batman forever page oh god (laughs) dr chase meridian's name is a reference to the fact that she's chasing batman (laughs) i was like that's not a reference what are you talking about they've since corrected it But back when we did Terminator 3 on the podcast, (laughs) the IMDb page for that was insane. Was it really? People being like, the Terminators could have stopped Nazis and stuff like that. It was wild. Wow. It was was the Wild West, man. It was untamed. (laughs) um, That's why I I appreciate it. Matt Gorley used to have a thing on uh, I Was There Too where he would ask the actors, like, is this actually true trivia? Or can can you, like, dispel this? Debunk it. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, all right, guys. Well, let's let's get into the wrap up here. Um, sure. I want to talk about because this is typically something we talk about with horror movies. Um, the best kill of the movie. Yeah. I'm going to take a guess that it's got to be the laser hallway is the best kill of the movie. Am I wrong? That was close. Oh, for me. OK. My f- my favorite is the li- is the liquor kill. I okay. think it's really fun. Yeah, it is fun. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, Nick, what about you? Do you have a best kill? Um. Uh, it's hard to rule out the um, hard to rule out the laser one because it's yeah. so iconic. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it it shocks you really actually. Yes. In the, in, you know, you're like, oh my god, yes. they've just killed off half the cars. <laughs> right. And then equally, you know, in, in, in the elevator one at the, at the very beginning, you're like, oh, oh yeah. sure, yeah, that's that that. Yeah, two iconic death scenes in this movie. Absolutely, and not one of them from a zombie, which that is, is, which, is a, which is a point we've discussed. That it's is like, true. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm tempted to say. Uh, the, the liquor getting spent at the end, just because it's uh, that that is a nice homage to. Yes, I agree. And it's a rightful a good death, one. like it's a well deserved one. It is. He's like, oh my, and then right. he, <laughs> he just drops on him, and yeah, I I, I I think I'll go for that one. Okay, all right. Well, uh, regular listeners of the show will know that we have a bunch of different little fun segments here at the end. Yep. One of least, um, one of not my favorite ones here is uh, prop cop. So, for new listeners, this is um, there's a there's tons of props in this movie, yeah. and we want to add one of those props to each of our collections. So, we'll pick the best one, and uh, we'll claim that one as our own. Nick, you're our you're uh, our esteemed guest. Is there a prop in this movie that you think would be cool to just have in real life? So this is this is actually a true story. I I, I nearly did get a prop from this film. Oh, oh wow. And and it was the an actual Cerberus zombie wow. dog model. That's right. I think you've told this on on the Resident Evil podcast before. I have. Yeah, yeah it's, been, it's such a long time ago, and I I struggle I struggle to remember precisely. <laughs> but my 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 cousin at the time worked for Frame Store, which is the CG, uh, which is the um, computer animation. Right. Who did um, uh, Batman and things like that? Mm-hmm. And anyway, so I think they either he or his friend worked on this film or at least they or frame store i think did some part of this um it must have been like the, uh, the work experience boys or something who knows uh-huh. but my cousin was told that when he when his friend went into the storeroom of frame store or whatever a special effects company it was yeah. there was a the model cerberus just out the back had been thrown wow. out or something like that <laughs> And so he told my cousin, oh, well, I've just, just seen the zombie dog from Resident Evil. And then he was like, oh, my cousin will love it. So he asked me, Nick, do you want, do you want the zombie dog? He's like, yes, yes, I do. Um, with absolutely no regard to where it would go. What, yeah. what, but, you know. 
<laughs> yeah. So he said, "Okay, I'll, I'll I'll try and get it for you." And then so he did. He passed it back, and then um, he missed it by like a couple of days because oh, it was no. <laughs> so, yeah. uh So I I lament the fact that I do sure. not have the zombie dog um, from Resident Evil. That'd be that'd be there's great. There's a couple of there's a couple of other things. So yeah, the zombie dog would be great. I mean, we we talk about the impact these movies have had and the the the, the general T virus vile. Um, yeah. The, the, the double helix, the helix thing. I mean, that's actually transcended the movies to an extent whereby if you show it, people will know it. Yeah. At, at, yeah. You know, from it. And so much so, people actually think it's from the games. Yeah. Uh, when it's not, it very briefly appears in Operation Raccoon City, but it's, uh, it's not canon sure. in, in the games, but it's. You, you you will often see it in people's collections, you know, where they uh-huh. go look at my Resident Evil collection and they will often have a you know, a three D printed mm-hmm. T virus sample and it will be the one from the movie. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, that'll be my option. Yeah. I think, they, I, think I, I think it's a good look. I still think yeah. it's a cool design. For sure. It is very cool design. That was actually my, my number one choice before I decided on another one. Um Nathan, what about you? Do you have a, a prop in mind that you want to keep? Yeah, I figured you were gonna pick the T virus so you could reanimate your Frankenstein <laughs> monster that you've been putting together through oh, the yeah. season. Um, so Nick, th- throughout the whole season, I've been picking props <laughs> that would essentially would work to build parts. a Frankenstein monster. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but no, I did not. I did not select the T virus. I had a feeling that was going to be a, a very coveted item. Oh, so, sure. Uh, what did you? What do you want? Uh, Nick? Uh, I want the big key that they put together that shuts down the Red Queen, like oh, the sure, big, uh, sure. the big EMP, EMP device. Yeah. It's a good centerpiece, I think. That's like yeah. that's a good living room piece. I put my record player on top of it. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, I originally was going to go with the gun that they use to inject the virus sure. into the rabbits, the 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 hypo gun. But yeah, I think my the prop that would be the coolest is is the newspaper at the end that just says the dead walk. Right, which is a Romero reference, right? I think that's really cool. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a really cool prop to have. Absolutely, that is a, that is available. I think you can find that. That's, Ooh. Um, Ooh. people have definitely de- people have definitely got it. Um, you can read what they've said on it. Uh, a lot of it is. Or is that from that could be from Apocalypse actually? There's one there's one there's one about Valentine, yeah. Yeah, they did it as a as a as a press kit for Apocalypse. There oh, was like a, a, like a marketing yeah, 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 that was like yeah. That's right. I remember seeing that on a YouTube video about about like behind the scenes stuff for the, the movies. Okay. I do remember that that news that newspaper I'm looking at it very carefully, yeah, it says the dead walk and then look at the date, it says September two thousand and two. Right. Like, oh, very clever. Yeah. 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 That, but it should be nineteen ninety eight. But it then should be nineteen ninety eight for sure. Sure. But then at the beginning of the movie, it says at the beginning of the 21st century. So straight away, you're yeah. straight, you're not dealing with the right time scales. So, right. You know. Yeah. There we go. Oh, speaking of which, that just reminds me. In the book, <laughs> in the book, 9/11 is canon, oh, right. which I thought was so bizarre. <laughs> oh yeah, they don't they they hint that like it the, the T virus program started like as a response to the like the war on terror or something like that. I, I don't remember that specifically, but okay. I remember them saying something like in a world where blah, blah, blah happens and blah, blah, blah happens and planes fly into build and skyscrapers. Okay. And I'm like, oof. what was the weird, you sent us a screenshot of the oh novel that was like TikTok <laughs> fucking dead or something like that. Like it was the weirdest. No, no, no. So <laughs> hold on, I'm pulling it up now. There is also a weird um, line about autism too. That was very bizarre um about like giving the t-virus was like giving the atomic bomb to an autistic child or something like that and i was like jesus christ book Book. listen book yeah oh yeah oh yeah here Uh, it is (laughs) he fell to the floor then he got back up fuckity fuck 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 (laughs) that's a that's that's Stephen King level esque writing, right? That's like a yeah. That's like a weird haiku. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want that on my my uh, epitaph on my tombstone. <laughs> I want to get a back mural tattooed on me of that. <laughs> um. All right. Well, let's jump over to another one of my favorite segments, bit part. Yeah. So this is um for new listeners. This is if there's a small role in the movie that you think would be perfect for you to play. Uh, what would it be? So Nathan, what about you? What's a what's a good bit part in this movie? So I had thought about the zombie with the axe, but I really want to be the guy in the office at the beginning of the movie who gets the coffee spilled on the him. coffee guy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Like I want to be that guy. Oh, I think that's a good line delivery you did there. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I'm auditioning for a play soon, so oh, okay. I'm a little rusty. <laughs> uh, Nick, what about you? Is there a cool part in this movie that you think would be 
right for Nick? Oh, blimey. Um, <laughs> poss- possibly the scientist uh, who gets drowned in, in the, the the male chap oh, in, yeah. the, uh, in the office. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we didn't mention it too, but there's the producer has a cameo in this movie. Yeah, as the zombie that scares Matt when he's at Lisa's desk. <laughs> it's, it's a weird little cameo. Is that Jeremy Bolt in that? Oh, I, I I believe that I might be right. right. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna look it up. Because 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 yeah, the, 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 as I said earlier, the woman is his sister. I think um, Anna Bolt. Yeah, yeah. I think you might be right. I know it's one of the producers though. Yeah, it could, it could be. I didn't know that, but yeah. Um, yeah, I think that that chat would have been quite cool with the yeah. That that'd be my role. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. Um, so uh, I decided to go with I want to be the Red Queen hologram. Yes, like I want my likeness to have been used. I mean, they can still <laughs> say it's they 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 can still say it's based off Ashford's daughter and just have my likeness as, <laughs> as the Red right. Queen. <laughs> so uh, did you get the feeling that they ran out of a budget for the Red Queen, which is why we don't get a hologram in the second half of the movie? They they maybe did like yeah they spent all their money on like the liquor yeah uh, design and stuff like that and yeah it wasn't cheap probably not probably not yeah all right well let's get into um the whole reason we're here and the crux of the show is sure. the silver linings. So, um, again, for those who are new to the show, this is um, the part of the show where we've watched the movie now and the movie ends on, you know, either a bummer or a cliffhanger or something. In this instance, a cliffhanger. Uh I mean, Alice comes out to an entirely destroyed city. What's going to happen next? What's what's but our goal is to come up with what's the silver lining? What's the the beacon of hope? What's the, the good that came out of this bad? Like, you know, what's that little nugget? And looking at it as a single movie, yes. not like not knowing what we know from the yes. sequels. Yeah. Yeah, very true. Yeah, I, we try to ignore any sequels for a movie just so we can say, hey, this movie has this silver lining in it. Right. So, so Nick, I'm going to give you some time. You don't have to have one, but I'll give you some time to think if, if you want to. Cheers. Nathan, what about uh, what about you? What's your silver lining for Resident Evil? <laughs> okay, I have a joke one and a serious okay, one. Okay, so you're filling in for Mally on this show. Right, right. So my <laughs> serious one is if you're looking at it as just one film – there's no way that Umbrella would be able to keep this under wraps. Oh, that was one of mine. Okay. Yeah. My joke one is uh, Paul W.S. Anderson found a wife. <laughs> like there, was a, there was a lovely 20 year marriage that came out of this movie. Absolutely. And he's, they're still they're, together. They're still making movies together. I mean, yeah. Monster Hunter came out recently. I too. never I saw seen that. It, yeah, I haven't seen it either. I think I'm good. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, my silver lining is that, um, well, Alice barely held a gun in this movie. Right. She she kills the dogs and that's pretty much it with the gun. I mean, it doesn't really help her with the liquor. So even without a gun, she cleaned house. For sure. She kills people throughout this entire movie by kicking them and snapping their necks and stuff. So now that she's got a shotgun and she's out in the open and she's not in an enclosed environment, I think she's going to do just fine. (laughs) Like that's my silver lining. It's Alice is going to be just fine. Don't you worry, viewer. (laughs) Um, so like I said, Nick, you don't have to have one, but if you've thought of one, we're more than happy to, to hear it. No, I was going to agree, actually. Yeah. I mean, she's far more experienced now. She remembers yeah. everything, as she, as, she, as she will tell us. And, yeah, uh, she, and she will very <laughs> often remind us throughout this fridge. <laughs> so in theory, yes, yeah, she should be able to, uh, to make it out of, uh, Tor- downtown Toronto, I think it was, uh-huh. it was filmed. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> make it out of Canada. <laughs> make it out of Canada, fine, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, from, from a kind of out of universe perspective it's even though it's not as well liked within the kind of gaming community as it, sure. uh, as you'd imagine it, it's still part of the fact and a contributor towards the fact that the series has yeah. been going on 25 years absolutely um you know it's, it's done well enough to warrant uh, a reboot it's done well enough to warrant a netflix series right. and it's and it's done well enough for Capcom to invest in uh, doing CGI films. Yeah, I think along alongside like Final Fantasy Advent Children as well. I think uh, it, that spurred them on a bit. Which I also think is a good movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know, there's clearly a market for it. And as as I've often said, the the impact he's had on the series um, has been quite significant. Definitely. Sure. You know, that there, there, there is a lot more references. I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed at myself for not remembering all of them because I did write them all down once <laughs> um, to, to remember um, what all the links were. But, you know, the only thing that that surprises most people is that Alice has never appeared in any game. Right. It is surprising that there's not even like a nod 
to her. The, yeah, we, you've got a dress in Outbreak File too, which yeah. is, I mean, it, it's not it's not even of exactly the same. But you know, considering you've had loads of spin-offs and skin, you know, skins you could sure. put on. Uh, re, you know, some I mean, of, I think it would make sense to put her in Resistance. Why not? Yeah, exactly. Why not? You know, even chuck her in the upcoming Reverse. Reverse. Really it's to, still what, what, not here yet. <laughs> right. Not here yet. Well, why not? You know, and people wouldn't necessarily mind if yeah. it's in that. Is you know, if it's not in that can. You get into that canon gray area with those those spin off things like reverse and right. resistance and stuff. Because there's, there's a lot of people that came into the series because of because of the movies. I exactly. did a, I did a conve- I did a convention last year and I was just kind of talking to people about you know my podcast and you know the games and why I got into it. And then mm-hmm. someone one, someone in the audience just says, "What about the movies?" And I was, I was taken back by it. She, you know, she was saying that she watched the movies first, yeah, and then went to play the games. Right. And it's like that, exactly my experience with Silent Hill as it happened. I've just never seen it as being a fair, you know, a, a great introduction to the games. Sure. I think they're so different, but there clearly has, has been people that, that, that that's happened to, and so that's the silver lining for sure. It keeps interest. It keeps, um, you know, it keeps the, keeps the name going. Oh yeah, that's a good meta silver lining. Yeah. It is. It is. You know, there's so many franchises that have come and got. You know, Silent Hill's now dead. Uh, uh, dead Space that is my just heart. about coming back. Yeah. Um, well, Dead Space is coming back. With a reboot, especially coming so. back, yeah. But you know, there's, 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 there's it, even Capcom's own Dino Crisis gone. Oh, sure, that's a shame uh, too. Ex, uh, Extermination was a fairly decent survival horror mm-hmm. game. Uh, mm-hmm. There's loads of franchises that have just been and gone, and RE still there. Yeah, and, yep. You know, the movie is certainly a factor in that longevity. Absolutely. Too. No, I, I think that's an often overlooked thing. Is that like you know the people that love the games kind of like look down on these movies but like them or not it kept capcom going like who knows how much financially it contributed to them making more games and more cgi films and stuff like that and you do kind of forget that there's a bit of gatekeeping that takes place in the the franchise community that like people that saw the movies first and then came into the games they always you know the the, the game community kind of turns their their nose up to people when they want to bring it up and so sure. right uh, I mean, not unjustly. I will say these. I mean, m- most of these movies are absolutely unwatchable. <laughs> but <laughs> you have to appreciate them for what they've done for the franchise. Yeah, you know, for sure. Um, I mean, Infinite Darkness that just came out, I thought was fine. I thought it was totally fine. I still haven't seen it. I need to check it it's, out. It's. I mean, I, I highly recommend you check out uh, Nick's podcast on it because they you guys kind of hit every single point that I wanted to make about it too. But um, oh, I'll, I'll do a watch along then. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. There you go. <laughs> um, but yeah. So um, lastly, I want to pick a, a, a double feature. So so Nick on the show, oftentimes we'll watch movies like that are really heavy, like Requiem for a Dream or something, and um, we don't want to leave the audience with just that movie and say, well. You know, our silver lining should pick you back up because sometimes it doesn't. True. Right. We always want to offer another movie as like a double feature that you watch after you watch the movie for the episode. It's like kind of like a like a pick me up. Like, uh-huh. hey, that you might be in bad spirits now, but watch this movie and you'll you'll feel better. So <laughs> we have we have the double feature. Um, Nathan, what do you got for what's a movie you should watch after Resident Evil if you're uh, kind of left on the cliffhanger there what's what's a movie that's gonna round you out well if you haven't gotten your fill of kung fu zombies and techno you should watch 2000s versus directed by uh ryue kitamura the director of godzilla final wars and midnight meat train nice it is a bizarre little super low budget uh action movie that uh, has a very similar vibe to this one uh, and a very kind of nonsensical plot, but some of the wildest zero budget gore and kung fu action that you could think of. Okay. Um, we mentioned it earlier, but um, I get a lot of flack from Mally, who absolutely fucking loves this franchise, <laughs> and I do not. Yeah. But I do like that first Fast and Furious movie. Oh, and I yeah. I do think Michelle Rodriguez is really good in that movie and i want more of her after watching this movie so i say watch that one watch sure. resident evil and plus they're basically in the same time zone when they came out and if you don't get your fill in new metal from this movie you can certainly get it <laughs> <laughs> you can certainly get it in the fast appearance so and and last week's movie freddy versus jason <laughs> yeah this is just a new metal centric month we got going on we here. sure do 
Um, okay, well, lastly, before we go, I want to know, do you guys recommend this movie? Um, Nick, let's let's start with you. I mean, I, th- I think I know your answer, but yeah, would you recommend this to someone who's never seen it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's a um, solid, solid entry. Just to go back on your point about the double features, oh, yes. I, mean, I, I would... I, I would pick up on it as a real left field. If you're keeping within the um, the RE series, it's obvious you could suggest I'll watch Degeneration or Damnation. Yeah, yeah. What, you should, what you should watch, what you should watch, uh-huh. if you can, before it gets taken off YouTube. Oh, no. It is, uh, <laughs> within the franchise, is Biohazard, which is the Japanese name for Resident Evil. But Biohazard, the stage. Ooh, what is this? I've been meaning to watch it. I I heard you guys' podcast on it, and it sounded good. <laughs> so in Japan, obviously they they, uh, they license out their name quite a lot. But uh, Biohazard the stage is a uh, is a stage show of Resident Evil, but it's a brand new st- storyline. Oh my god! Yeah, this is right up Nathan's alley, Nick. You have no idea. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, blimey! Now that was a question. Uh, when's it set? So it's set in Australia mm-hmm. with a uh, a university kind of uh, outbreak that happens Ooh. with Rebecca Chambers making a triumph triumphant return. Mm-hmm. Chris Redfield's there. BSAA come in. Uh, Pierce from uh, Resident Evil Six is there. So it's pre six, post great. five. Yeah, and you're a big fan of Pierce. I love Pierce. Yeah. <laughs> from what I've heard on your show. I mean, <laughs> And yeah, this is really, and of course, I mean, sadly, it it also stars um, uh, oh, recently passed away, uh, Chibi, Sunny Chibi. Oh, oh yeah, Sunny Chiba, yeah, mm-hmm. Sunny Chiba, yeah, yeah, uh, he's in it as well. Um, oh wow, whoa! Uh, one, of, one of his last things he did. This is insane. <laughs> it is for for it, as I said, it's a stage show, um, and it's been filmed, yeah, uh, proper pro- professionally filmed as well. It came out on DVD in Japan as well, which wow. I'm desperate to get a copy of. But mm-hmm. oh my god, I am 100 percent watching this tonight. <laughs> like <laughs> you have no idea. Incredible. It's a really good storyline, um, and. Yeah, it, it is on. It is on YouTube. Uh, just make uh, the the English sub version uh, is on YouTube mm-hmm. at the moment. Awesome. Well, there you go. That does sound like a good double feature. Uh, but it's a really good storyline. Um, it's it, it, and it is canonical. It, it's part of its official, you know, canon, if you like. Um, wow. So yeah. Yeah. There's been more after that. There's also something called Biohazard: uh, The Experience, which we're not sure is canon or not. That's, <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that's that's almost like a um, ooh, uh, you're in a big mansion kind of house uh, testing facility or something like gotcha. that. That's quite cool. Then there's also Biohazard: The Voice of Gaia, which is a musical Resident Evil, uh, which is what? all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> This is about singing zombies. <laughs> Don't ask. Um, I am pitching this to my local theater next year. <laughs> like, that sounds great. Uh, but yeah, they're the three. You've got the stage, the ex- uh, experience, and then the voice of Guy. But the stage is the is the one. It's written by um, uh, Kobe Ashi, I think. Oh who, wow! Who, uh, who did some of you know for five and um, five and six and things like that. Um, so yeah, that I, I would recommend anyone that if you can watch it, and it's a good couple of hours. The the practical effects are very good. Um, yeah, it's a good two hours, um, but well worth watching. And as I said, the English dub it, sub is on YouTube for the at the moment. It may be taken down. So um, right on. It's been taken down before, but yeah, well worth a watch. All right, awesome, great recommendation. I'm so <laughs> excited about this. Yeah, you have no idea, Nick. You just pushed all of Nathan's buttons. Plays, <laughs> like, musicals. As someone who's watched like. <laughs> the Mortal Kombat stage show and like <laughs> Ninja Turtles coming out of their shells tour. Oh like, my god, coming out of my coming out of their shells is a staple of my childhood. <laughs> this makes me so happy right now. Uh, and, and yeah, and as a theater nerd in general, like this is so cool. Yeah, it is it's great. Yeah. It's a nice it's, they have a nice flashback as well to the mansion incident, which is really cool. So. Oh excellent. I'm surprised I mean is Resident Evil the experience I'm, I'm if it may be this, but I'm surprised Capcom hasn't done any kind of like a uh, themed escape room. Oh they have oh Oh, there's been loads. Yeah, I was gonna say they have to have. Yeah, in Japan they've had they've had so they've got Biohazard the real, uh, and there's been three versions of them, mm-hmm. um, which have been escape uh, kind of like escape room, but walk through things, mm-hmm. you know, uh, awesome. that kind of things. That they've been really good set in like Raccoon City, uh, you know, as a kind of RPD officer. There's been yeah, that sounds dope. Biohazard Valiant Raid, which is a oh the VR yeah VR, yeah, yeah. VR experience, uh, which you play as kind of like hunk type character awesome. uh, in Resident Evil 2 mm-hmm. there's also uh, Biohazard 7 Walk Through the Fear which is a uh, Resident Evil 7 
prequel mm-hmm. yeah. whether it's uh where you're kind of trapped in the baker mansion and again you, you you've got to escape jack um as a as a, one of the people that's just been captured um by him um so there's all there's there's that um yeah they're the big things uh, they've been at they're in tokyo i think but they've had some of these experiences at, at universal studios in osaka that's great they should do a tofu survivor restaurant experience <laughs> <laughs> I'm about that. That sounds great. <laughs> so I would say in terms of recommendations for this movie, I I do think this is a perfectly serviceable movie. Yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, it's fun. I think if you go into it knowing that it's not the games yeah. and that it's kind of a fresh take on things, you will enjoy it. Like I'm, I'm of this opinion that I think if this was the only live action Resident Evil movie we got to date, yeah. it would not get the hate that it gets. I think those sequels really tarnish the the, the main Resident yeah. Evil. Yeah. 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 Um, but no, I think this is well made yeah. for its time. I think it's fun. It's dumb. It's goofy. <laughs> it's got some great moments in it. Like, and some genuine creep factor like going on yeah um, which those later movies do not have yeah and we talked about music on the mandy episode recently mm-hmm. and i i this this score i forgot how good it is and i yeah. think it's gonna end up going on my my writing playlist like my instrumental I was thinking playlist the same thing i was thinking the same thing but marco beltrami doesn't miss i mm-hmm. mean the the logan score too is really great yeah you know we talked briefly about the upcoming upcoming live action stuff i Lance Reddick is Wesker. I am so in on. Mm. Very on board for that. Yeah. yeah. I'm very excited to see what he does with that. And I think Donald Logue as Chief Irons. Oh, yeah. is going to be fantastic. <laughs> I hope. I kind of hope they lead more towards the remake version because I just want to see Donald Logue just frothing at the mouth. <laughs> drunk. <laughs> just <laughs> insane. <laughs> sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe we'll have to reconvene. Maybe that Welcome to Raccoon City movie will qualify for the show. Yeah. But I guess uh, mm. only time will tell. So, Nathan, do you recommend Resident Evil? Oh, 100%. Like I like I said, I think it's it's definitely got its flaws, but it's it's so fun. And it's a it's a nostalgic favorite for me, too. Like I like this was this is a prime example of like gateway horror. Mm-hmm. Like this is an action movie that's got some spooky bits that I think, uh, you know, can kind of prime you to watch, you know, the granddaddies of the zom- zombie genre. Like sure. this, this prepares you to watch stuff like day of the dead and night of the living dead, mm-hmm. uh, return of the living dead, which is my favorite zombie film of all time. Whoa. Uh, and I, yeah, this is a, this is Old. a really, yeah, no, I, yeah, this is a really fun movie. I would 100% recommend checking it out. Okay. I think so. We're all in agreement. This is a, a watchable movie, and it's it's fun, and entertaining. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, um, audience, I know I'm sure there are plenty of you out there that either agree with us or disagree. So uh, you can send your feedback on what you think about Resident Evil to uh, our email at the Silver Linings Playlist at gmail dot com, or you can DM us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, just search for the Silver Linings Playlist, and you'll find us. And lastly, you can find us on our subreddit at reddit.com slash silver linings playlist. Um, if you haven't already, of course, we ask the usual podcast roundup. You subscribe, rate, and leave feedback. Sure. Um, we post every day on our Instagram and Twitter, so feel free to follow us on there. Uh, and if you have a suggestion for a movie that you think does not end in that happily ever after that most Hollywood movies end in and you think it would be great for the show, by all means, send us a, send us your suggestion. Mally is um, not here, obviously, but his movie is what's up next on our agenda. Right. Um, And he has texted me a clue for what the movie we're covering next week is going to be about. So the clue that Mally has given me, I don't, god damn it. It says. So annoying. (laughs) (laughs) Mally's clue for next week is men really are awful. And I'm terrified for who Dustin sides with in this movie, which Mally's never going to hear this, but Mally, suck a dick. <laughs> <She's kind of> a... <laughs> yeah, hostile. Uh, hostile. Yeah. <laughs> Mally is um, our antagonist, uh, Nick. I, I don't know. You haven't had a chance to hear an episode. He's our Wesker. Right. So. <laughs> He's the villain. <laughs> um, but again, thank you, Nick, so, so much for coming on the show. No, it no worries. absolutely a thrill to have you. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Listener, if you haven't, please go check out the Resident Evil podcast, wherever you get podcasts. Yes. And, and Nick, is there anything you want to plug uh, for your show? Any exciting things coming up i mean you mentioned the 
eventual co- commentary for the final chapter oh, yeah. but is there anything more uh more on the the horizon that's coming up uh pretty soon for you guys uh well yeah we've um i mean first if you check out our website resident evil podcast.com you can look at that uh a time the timeline mm-hmm. um that uh, batman's done and some other features as well yeah it's a fantastic read it is it's a great it's, read yeah it's incredible and that is being updated uh to take into account village and infinite darkness um as well so we've got that coming up so it's coming up to 20 years of resident evil gaiden Oof. believe it or not oh yeah which is which which is the never the the never controversial uh game boy color game <laughs> uh which i i also have a uh-huh. uh a soft spot f- for me sure. too yes yeah we're gonna be doing something on that um and also it's 20 years in september uh, well in september in the west of uh, the first wesker's report mm, sure. dvd which uh, was the f- for most people the first time we ever got any kind of supplemental material outside of japan so we're gonna have a retrospective look at that as well <laughs> but, uh, we have got as i said we've got we're coming up to our 10 year anniversary so we've got some big things planned so um that's great in terms of uh website and things like that so yeah keep it there but you can there's links to all our facebook and twitter on, on the web page so um just head over there and join us awesome all right well fantastic that's a that's a plethora uh, of, of material and content for you guys to check out mm. so um nick and you also have an open invite anytime you want to come back on the show absolutely oh thank you very much we may even eventually do silent hill i think that movie qualifies for the show i think so it's been a minute since i've revisited it i can't believe we haven't got a dead space movie or anything really other than right. the animated ones that blows my mind mm. hey maybe this maybe this reboot will uh get that going i i mean just get John Carpenter to do it it's before it's too late. It's basically Ghosts of Mars, but good, right? <laughs> it's it's Event Horizon. Sure. That's really all it is. <laughs> Just do that. Uh, anyway, um, well, rest in peace, Oatmeal. Um, and uh, as always, Excelsior. You're all going to die down here. Uh, that was the obvious outro. God damn it. <laughs> Excelsior. 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 Excelsior! Oh. Look it up! Hello YouTube! If you've made it this far, thanks! Could you do us one more favor? Could you hit those like and subscribe buttons? Maybe leave us a comment on what you think of the show. We'd really appreciate it. Join us again next week for an all new episode. Bye!